This is the 2018 Android Microconference. Um, so um, a few things about the microconference itself. Uh, first, um, I'd like to welcome you uh, on behalf of Todd Amit and myself, uh, the organization committee. Um, this is uh, the yearly sync point where we get um, quite a number of people from the Google team um, to sync with the kernel development teams and whoever is interested in any of the Android work. Um, this year is a bit different because unlike the other years where we take a double slot, where we had we have just one slot, and yesterday there was a full talk by Sandeep, which ran through most of the you know theory part of what's new and so on. Um, so the focus really is on discussion. Um, I will be really strict about the 15 minute that is allocated to every talk. So. Um, if you haven't gotten to any discussion by 10 minutes, I'm going to probably shut you down right there and say, okay, that was your last slide. You're okay, uh, switching over the mics. Um, so the material for all the presentations is online already. So I, you know, by all means, if there's a topic that's of interest to you, just go ahead and grab the slides and look at them ahead of time. So when the talk comes around, you have your questions ready. Um, what else should I say? Yeah. It, Obviously, 15 minutes is pretty short, so we don't expect the discussions to kind of like end at 15 minutes. The goal is to start the conversation, and by all means, you know, the hallway is open for anybody to continue the conversation. There is a break at uh, 3:30, um, so you know, we'll, we'll, that'll get, be an opportunity to, um, if, if nothing else, start some of those conversations if they, if they haven't already started. Um, there is a etherpad that Michelle is going to be maintaining. By all means, please feel free to contribute to it. It is open to all. Um, as I had mentioned to the speakers ahead of time, uh, we are going to do something a bit different this year. Um, so as a summary for um, the um, end of day tomorrow, I'm going to be presenting this progress report. And effectively, I got a one line per discussion item. Um, you know, wins to-dos and losses. You have changed the names if you like, don't like them, I don't care. Um, essentially, just put bullet items in there. Um, put <coughs> anything that's important in bold, regardless of which of the three categories it falls into. The point is, anybody that reads this six months down the road knows what was made in terms of progress on any of these specific topics that we talked about. So um, if you're one of the speakers, please make sure to fill your line you know, by end of day today. That'd be great. Um, Cameras. Okay, so the rule I was told is speakers have to essentially be here leftward, not in front of the camera here. So anywhere from where I am to my left is good. All right, and that's about all I got to say. I'm turning it over to Martin. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, the mic is right here. If you want mine, I can give it to you as well. Uh, I just have to find the power button. Here's my incompetence showing. Come on, how do I turn this guy on? Yeah, I'm thinking about twisting it, but no. How about this? All right, so uh, my name is uh, Martijn. I work in the uh, Android team at Google. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about a patch series named Symbol Namespaces. Um, so let's start the problem that this patch series is trying to tackle. Um, so the problem that we're trying to solve is that the kernel has, uh, as of recent kernel version, more than 30K exported symbols. Um, and those symbols are basically exported into a global namespace, which means that they are visible to all modules uh, that are present in the kernel. And the problem this creates is that it's really hard to manage the export surface um, because any module can use any symbol. Um, sometimes you get modules using symbols they really shouldn't be, like symbols that are meant to be internal to a certain subsystem, for example. Um, and these kind of infractions can also be really hard to catch in code review because um, not all symbols are named very well. Like there are some symbols where you really wonder what subsystem they belong to, and it's not so obvious um, that you really shouldn't be using a symbol. Um, and so it makes it really hard to reason about the export surface or even to visualize the export surface. Um, trying to make it more specific how this affects Android is if you <coughs> attended Sandeep's talk yesterday, you saw that we want to move to a model where we basically have a single kernel image um, for, an for an architecture. And that means that all the device specific stuff, um, all the driver for a touchscreen and things like that, uh, they will actually be loadable kernel modules. 
Um, and because the kernel currently doesn't have a stable API, um, that means those modules could break if somebody updates any one of these symbols. Um, and we basically want to reduce, or actually really we want to el eliminate the chance of such breakages, such that when your SSC vendor or Android delivers you a new generic uh, kernel image that you don't have to wor worry about your modules breaking because uh, some of these symbols have changed. Um, so there are different categories of exported symbols. Um, you know, there are symbols that are actually meant for drivers to be used. Um, but there are also quite some symbols that are really only exported because some core kernel functionality is split up into multiple modules. Like the IPv4 stack is an example where you know, the implementation is split over multiple modules and that's the only reason why the symbols are exported. But it doesn't really make sense to use these symbols. Uh, it doesn't make sense for a driver outside of the IP subsystem to use these symbols. And some symbols are really only meant for internal entry use or for debugging. Um, but because they're all in a global namespace, there is no way to indicate this um, or to limit their use. So the idea of symbol namespaces is to make this API surface more clear and to allow to differentiate between these different classes of exports that we have. Um, but also to reduce the global API surface so that there's not this one big pool of symbols that people can uh, put into their drivers, but actually make it much more concise what symbols are meant for use and which aren't. Uh, so talking about the exported API, uh, just a reminder, if you have regular C language, <coughs> it's a static. Um, it's not visible to local <coughs> kernel modules. Um, or if you have global linkage, it's not visible to local, local uh, kernel modules as well, global kernel modules. You actually have to export a symbol for it to be usable by modules. And so this is where we have 30K instances to, today. Um, so if you look at uh, the, the diagram on the right, like the global symbols are visible only to built-in code, and then the exported symbols in orange is basically what's visible to loadable kernel modules, which is a subset. So what uh, the symbol namespace patch series does is it allows you to export a symbol to a specific namespace. So instead of saying just export symbol uh, with a function name, you actually uh, append the namespace as a second parameter to the export symbol macro. Uh, what this does is basically puts a symbol in a separate namespace and you will only as a driver be able to use a symbol in such a namespace if you implicitly, explicitly import this namespace into your driver. Um, so doing that is very simple. There is a simple macro, module import an S and you specify the namespace that you want to import. And once you put such a statement in your driver, then you will be able to use the symbols that are in that namespace. Um, so you know, the result is on the right. So instead of having just this big global pool of exported symbols, um, you know, the global export symbol size has become a bit smaller, and instead we have uh, a new nice delineated USB storage uh, uh, symbol namespace, which can only be accessed by drivers importing it. And so the result of this is that, by default, the number of exported system symbols is a lot smaller, uh, and the API is also a lot more cleanly defined. Like, if somebody now wanted to use these symbols in a driver that it doesn't belong to, it's a lot easier to catch that. You know, somewhere on the top it says, import namespace USB storage, and you could think, right, this doesn't make sense. This driver really shouldn't be using any symbols from that namespace. Um, the, the other thing I, I worked in the patch, patch series is uh, automation. Um, because one of the implications of, of using this is that if you export or you know, limit a symbol to a certain namespace, you have to find all usages of that symbol and add like, the relevant import namespaces to the driver. Um, and that can be really annoying because you know, it's hard to track down all usages of a symbol. So the patch set basically contains a script that automatically calculates the dependencies um, of a driver to which namespaces it depends on, and it can actually auto-add them with a CogGNL script, which is basically the semantic patcher that the kernel already uses. So if you want to convert your subsystem to uh, use exported or to export symbols to a namespace, all you have to do is move it to a namespace, run the script, and the script will automatically patch all the drivers using that symbol to import the namespace itself. So it's really easy to use. Um, so the current upstream status, the patch set is really small, so it's around three lines of code, which includes uh, the automation that I just mentioned. Uh, I sent a V1 series in July, and the feedback has been uh, positive. I think the, the high-level feedback so far, and uh, not strictly related to the implementation itself, has been that it would be nice to auto-export <coughs> uh, symbols based on the module name, so that you don't actually explicitly have to go into your uh, module and say export to this namespace, but say all symbols for this module go into this namespace. So that's just something to make it even easier to use. Uh, likewise, an auto-import, like there may be some drivers that all live in the same directory, and they all need to import that namespace. So instead of manually adding like import statements, 
uh, to each driver, you could also say, well, for all the drivers um, in this directory, you know, auto, auto import uh, that namespace. So the idea is to, uh, to collect some feedback here uh, and hopefully send out a V2 next week um, and we'll see where it goes. So I have some slides on the implementation, but I first wanted to start a discussion to just get a feeling for you know, do you recognize the problem that I've described and what do you think about you know, the solution? Can you tell me how does it work with inheritance? Like if some of the symbols you're importing also use other exported symbols, what happens? Can you say that? If the symbols that you import mm -hmm. in turn use other exported symbols, how does that work? Uh, yeah, it doesn't inherit automatically, so you do need to specify it uh, explicitly. If you inherit, it won't even, it never shows up. Because you inherit it from another module, and that module gets loaded. It doesn't matter. Right, so, so that module has its own import. That module has its own imports, yeah, yeah. and that has its own symbols, and it but, doesn't even matter. But for the checks that Google wants to do, but it's, it's still per module. You want to see what each module consumes. If this module depends on another module, Great, then you see what that module consumes. It's still checking okay. on a per module basis. If you want to do reports to do inheritance, everything's going to go to the root, right? right. But I guess some of the namespaces are going to be kind of meaningless, like clock, everyone is going to import clocks, right? Clock, yeah, or USB, or USB serial. I mean, but we need to start scoping this somehow. Thanks. But at least, like for clock, not all the exported Global, not all the globally exported clock functions need to be exported, right? That, that's the thing. We want to start reducing the size of that. I was just going to say that uh, the nesting part can also be post-processed by an external tool tool as well. Like, for example, if a module imports a bunch of symbols, but that depends on another module. <coughs> so then that report can be generated externally. It doesn't have to be baked into the whole importing mechanism. Can you go back one slide? Yeah, sure. So when you say auto export to namespace based on cable mod name, um, <coughs> is this for things that you're saying want to export to a namespace? So take the USB core, for example. If I have a function that says export symbol namespace, and then you're saying you would automatically fill that in with USB core based on the cable mod name? Yeah, okay. exactly. So yeah, you, you don't manually have to add like the namespace to all of the exports, but you just do it based on the module name. OK. Um, I would like to not use that all the time because USB core is a module name instead of just USB. Yeah. It might be nice to override that. Yeah, I think it, it really depends on the granularity, like because some modules are really small and it probably doesn't make sense to like limit the scope of the symbols to just a module name, but you want to group them into a bigger a group of export symbols. Right? Yeah. yeah. So it, it really depends. So I think it's it's an optional thing that you can use but don't have to use. Okay. All right. Cool. I got no problem. Uh, both, yeah. So oh, okay. the, the patches modify uh, mod posts, basically. So, yeah, I can repeat the question. The question was whether I check for violations at load time or also build time. So the answer is both. Um, so the patches contain modifications to mod posts that basically checks for each symbol to which namespace it is exported, um, or whether it's exported to a namespace at all, and then for all uses of uh, that symbol, whether they import the relevant namespace. Um, there is some discussion about whether it should be a warning or an error. Um, if you fail to import, um, I'm more towards leaving an error at this point. And I think that, that has also been the upstream feedback so far. Like if we you know, can enforce this, the sooner the better. Is that coming after module dependencies? Like how, if that <coughs> module that is exporting the, the namespace is, hasn't been loaded yet, <coughs> how, how is that handled? Um, so, I mean, the namespace is not exclusive to a module, like a namespace can be used by multiple modules, right? So all that mod post does is it parses all the symbols 
that are exported by a module and assigned those symbols to a particular Yeah, you said that runtime when you, the module gets loaded, uh -huh. you check all the imported namespaces. But that depends on another module that might have not loaded yet. Right, so it happens after the, the dependency. Yeah, that doesn't change. Yeah. Um, hey, Martin. Um, so, uh, uh, so this this is this is really really good stuff. I I just had a side comment. Like, uh, one of the things about modules is, uh, you know, you can you can try to partition it like this, but you can't really control what is called into the kernel right after module is loaded. So if somebody wanted to do, you know, do something like KL sims lookup and get the function pointer. Yeah, and yeah. this is actually something that came up is people would like to use this even for in-kernel stuff, right? So this mechanism allows you to enforce it across modules, but it would be nice if you could actually enforce it, you know, for in-kernel use too, uh, which is something I haven't really looked at, but it would be interesting to be able to do such a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just curious, uh, in, in generating these patches, did you find many situations where there were, you know, drivers using, you know, symbols that they shouldn't be, or is there any, like examples of violations that were could be corrected or something like that? I mostly I use the USB subsystem, which is you know pretty well contained. Um, I know Greg has told some stories about you know many cases. Uh, where drivers were trying to use symbols that they shouldn't use, or actually people try to add symbols to the export namespace that really shouldn't happen. So I know such things have happened in the past. For sure. Yes, so I, I looked at this for a certain large SOC vendor's driver <laughs> tree, and it was horrible. Um, they were exporting. And then you see that when they try and push those drivers upstream and randomly try and export random symbols, mm -hmm. and that's what caused me to trigger this all. It's like that, they shouldn't be doing that, and this is a big hint that they shouldn't be doing that. Okay. Okay, we've got about 30 seconds left. Uh, last question. So how do you, uh, once this, how do you start off here? Is this every subsystem is clean slate and everyone starts importing everything, or do you automatically add import, uh, imported namespaces and then everyone starts cleaning up? What's, how yeah, so this right now it's an incremental approach. So we will keep the global namespace, um, and if subsystems want to start converting, they can simply you know, start exporting to a namespace, run the script and add the updated drivers. Um, so it's really a matter of, you know, we can convert subsystem by subsystem um, over. There's not really any inter-subsystem dependencies. All right. Thanks. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Okay. Saren, please. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Suren Bagdasarian. I work for Google, and um, today I'll be presenting a PSI monitor for memory pressure detection. So, <clears throat> currently in uh, Android, we use uh, VM pressure signals to uh, detect memory pressure. Uh, however, um, VM pressure really uh, measures uh, reclaim efficiency rather than uh, what we want to measure, which is how much uh, the user experience is affected by uh, memory contention. So it has a number of other issues, but this is a fundamental problem for us, uh, for, for what we are trying to do. Um, so um, uh, up to recently, we didn't have any other uh, mechanisms to do that, but a recent uh, patch set called PSI, which is pressure store information, uh, it was merged um, a couple of weeks ago into uh, V420 by uh, John Zwainer. And uh, what it does, it uh, measures amount of time that tasks are delayed as a result of uh, resource contention. And resources in these cases can be uh, memory, I.O., or CPU. So it uh, records the uh, complete delay or stall. Um, the total stall time uh, average and calculates averages over 10, uh, 60, and 300 seconds. So PSI allows to uh, uh, basically it records uh, complete and partial stalls, and I can talk a little bit more about what complete and partial stall means. Um, and um, it uh, considers in those calculations number of CPUs and number of non-idle tasks. Uh, the most important part for us is it uh, represents a much more uh, direct measure of 
how the user is affected by um, uh, memory contention uh, because it directly measures the delay time of the tasks. <coughs> so uh, that's all great, but um, why we cannot use uh, vanilla PSI implementation on Android? So Android is, uh, usually runs on mobile systems, which have uh, quite limited amount of memory, relatively limited amount of memory. And our applications and services are quite often unpredictable, and they have unpredictable and aggressive uh, memory usage patterns. So your uh, memory usage might be uh, growing uh, too fast for uh, averages uh, to reflect that growth. Uh, because averages, as I said, are over multiple seconds. So in those multiple seconds, your system might become uh, unusable before you can do anything with it. Um, so um, to deal with that, uh, we are working on a PSI monitor patch set. Uh, so it heavily utilizes already existing PSI machinery. Um, it, uh, it monitors the PSI signal um, whenever a system enters a stall state. So normally it does, is not active. It activates only when there is a, a stall uh, being recorded. Um, the API is very similar to VM pressure API, so you can use event FDs to uh, wait for the events from the user space. Um, it supports uh, multiple concurrent monitors uh, for all PSI uh, metrics, and <coughs> each, uh, each of those multiple monitors uh, supports its own configurable threshold and tracking window, which are uh, expressed in uh, microseconds, so it's in time units. Uh, this chart uh, shows uh, basically the implementation of the PSI monitor. It's a simple uh, uh, sliding window. Uh, you can see in the beginning that uh, when there is no stall, the, the blue line is the st uh, stall signal. So when it's not growing, the PSI uh, uh, monitor is uh, dormant, so it's not active. As soon as it uh, starts growing, it activates and those vertical lines show where it checks the PSI growth. And as soon as uh, current PSI growth goes over the threshold, it basically will uh, generate a new event and user, user space will be uh, notified. So a small uh, simplification that we use, uh, when uh, <coughs> stall spans multiple windows, we assume the linear growth in the previous window. That allows, to, uh, uh, that allows us to uh, have a simpler implementation where we don't need to remember all the intermediate uh, points where we uh, in the previous window where we measured the PSI signal uh, and just uh, approximate basically the, um, the growth. Uh, I have a patch set which uh, implements this more strictly, basically remembering all those intermediate steps, but in testing uh, I didn't see much difference between those, so it seems to be a good approximation for at least our task. Um, and this last slide shows uh, comparison between PSI monitor and VM pressure during uh, while we are running a memory stress test. So uh, on the bottom there are several metrics that uh, show the memory um, situation of, this, uh, of our system. And those spikes show where uh, the memory pressure was so high that the stress was killed. And that's why we have kind of uh, our free memory spikes, uh, it goes up. And uh, on the chart, uh, on the uh, upper chart, um, I plot where the VM pressure events and PSI events were triggered. And uh, so on the bottom, under that black line, we have VM pressure events and on the top, v uh, PSI events. And you can see that the PSI events uh, show um, the points where uh, memory pressure grows high and we have to kill something. Uh, much better than uh, VM pressure events, which have a lot of uh, false positives. And it also triggers much less, which means user space will not be woken up very uh, often. Um, so that's, see? yeah, that's pretty much it. So open it for discussion. <coughs> yeah, are you planning to make these uh, accessible to third party apps? or only to the apps. system? Uh, 
So it will be exposed through uh, the same PROCFS or if you are using C groups, uh, same C group nodes um, that PSI uses nowadays. So uh, I'm not sure yet is if Android will uh, provide an API to um, use them. Uh, probably not directly because it's SE elegance policies and all that good stuff. Uh, but uh, we probably will will provide something uh, to for applications to um, to have more visibility about system state. Uh, we definitely plan to use it in the uh, activity manager, for example, so that they are more or less. Uh, we, we, this uh, uh, what this allows us to do is basically to coordinate between different parts of, of the system. So activity manager can know when pressure is high, so I don't need to respond uh, a process that was killed by low memory killer just a second ago. So uh, those kind of APIs, uh, they are possible with this patch. Um, as for what that API will be, uh, will look uh, like, uh, it's a bit early to, to, set, to tell. I mean, OK, <laughs> thank you. So you, uh, you're looking at uh, um killing. Is there any? It looks like you have an opportunity actually to detect systems, and perhaps take some action that's short of killing a process, maybe slowing it down somehow. Is uh, that? Sorry, could you repeat again the, the beginning? Uh, it looks like you have an opportunity to uh, measure processes and catch them earlier when they start to running into uh, some pressure, yeah. and take some other action besides killing them or sure. killing the antagonist. Uh, true. So uh, one, another benefit of PSI is that it's configurable. As I said, both of those threshold and um, sliding window are uh, basically in uh, time units. So it's much more understandable than, let's say, if we try to uh, tune VM pressures, and basically it's uh, um, it's difficult to find the connection between how uh, good your reclaim is or how efficient your reclaim is. Uh, with uh, how much time was lost by the, uh, for the user's tasks. In here, we, we are operating in a time domain, so it's much easier to tune. So, and you can have mon multiple monitors. You can have monitor at the lower threshold, which will uh, tell you, OK, we just started. The memory pressure just started mounting. So you can do some early actions. And there will be also monitors which say, OK, we are at critical level, so we need to kill something. Yeah, and just to add to that, for example, Android today, uh, the activity, uh, activity manager sends out notifications to applications for on-trim memory calls, where applications are supposed to volunteer and free up some memory. Those calls, as far as I understand today, uh, happen based on how many cached background apps are. Uh, something, uh, some thing like this, which gives you a notification from the kernel itself, can be used potentially to trigger those calls to the apps in order to free up some more memory. Four minutes. I know uh, there were some previous efforts to kind of move the uh, low yeah. memory killer out to user space that weren't, I guess, as successful <laughs> as the in-kernel uh, implementation. Um, how is this implementation doing relative? I mean, is, is there any sort of metrics of better or worse? Uh, compared to uh, kernel module, compared to the current uh, user space LMK? Or? Yeah. Um, so this test was, I specifically, this particular test, I ran with in-kernel LMK because most of the Android devices still use in-kernel LMK. So when, whenever those tasks, uh, this task is killed, it's uh, in-kernel LMK is killing. I want to make sure that you know, the, the switch to user space does not skew the results. Um, so the issue, of course, it's difficult to compete with in-kernel LMK because it's inside the kernel. You don't have to send to user space any signals and then <coughs> send secure back to kernel. So the round trip is much shorter. But there are also um, downsides of that. 
Uh, the biggest downside is that the coordination between LMK in kernel and your system, which is in the user space. Um, so up to now, basically, LMK was doing its own thing without coordinating anything with anybody. So this gives us an opportunity to actually coordinate in user space different parts of the system. So as I said, for example, if something is killed, the other part of the system does not try to respawn it. Um, so there, are up, there is upside of having it in user, user space, and we, we think that it's worth doing this, even though we take some heat on the performance, because you cannot get around the fact that you need you know, additional latency. You introduce additional latency by having uh, those mechanisms inside the user space. Okay. Thanks. So just uh, extending that question, um, so in terms of the latency for, um, you know, for the round trip, uh, since this is getting handled in user space, you know, do you have some stats and whether can it keep up uh, with, uh, you know, uh, certain spikes uh, of memory pressure where um, as part of direct reclaim, you really need the kills to have occurred really fast? Yeah, I was, yeah, the, the latency we were measuring when we uh, were moving to a user space LMK, uh, I did uh, collect a lot of stats about the latency of receiving the signal from the kernel and then sending seek kill. I have a number of patches in the kernel which improves that path also. Uh, some, uh, some drivers actually were delaying seek kill, for example. Um, it's, um, if I remember correctly, it was in the beginning of the year. Uh, the delays are uh, somewhere around uh, tens of mil uh, milliseconds. <coughs> In the, in the case of memory contention. Okay. Does the user space module kind of wait for the, f to see the impact of a kill before it decides to do anything else uh, in terms of other signals that it might receive subsequently? Um, you are talking about that, those fixes for, for drivers or? Uh, no, just the, the fact that, you know, once the kill is initiated, you know, the, the impact of the kill, you know, the memory that gets reclaimed as part of that, you know, does it take the complete? Okay, so the question is how, how fast the reclaim, uh, uh, the killed process is memory is reclaimed, or is, is that the question? Or? Yeah, like user space accounting for the entire memory that got released as part of the kill uh, before it acts on the subsequent uh, triggers. Okay, I'm going to suggest this continues on okay. because yeah. I switch to the next yeah. talk. Yeah, we can right. talk uh, offline. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, friend. Thank you. All right. So, hey, Christian. So, back and forth. Hey, my name is Christian. Um, I want to talk about dynamically allocated binder devices. So, uh, we <coughs> recently. I've uh, been starting, I think there's a patch set also now floating around on LKML. Um, we've been discussing using binary devices in different IPC namespaces, specifically in, 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 so in containers. Um, and there seem to be a bunch of people interested in this. Um, and there are a few limitations we, oh cool, uh, there are a few limitations we had. It never works on my laptop, that's why. Um, there are a few limitations we had uh, and that we tried to address uh, and that Todd, for example, helped out with. Uh, so, first of all, uh, binder is not available as a kernel module, and uh, there's a bunch of distributions that really don't want to set config uh, binder to yes by default. Uh, they'd much rather have it be loadable as a module. Uh, so we had a patch set um, for that or uh, originally, uh, but there were a bunch of problems that actually relate to export symbol, uh, because binder was using a functions that uh, Vero really didn't like that were used in the binder uh, driver. So these have been removed, um, but it's still outstanding, uh, making it possible to set, yeah, say basically that binder is available as a kernel module. That would be helpful. Um, and there are two other problems. Uh, the first one is there is currently no way to do dynamic device allocation. So meaning uh, you actually, I think, have to set uh, a string in the kernel config saying these are the binder devices that I want and then uh, the binder driver will chunk it into individual strings and then create the devices based on this but that's fixed like you cannot change this number as far as I understand right now uh, so that's a big limitation obviously because we might not know uh, at <laughs> compile time how many binder devices we need 
we Why don't you know that I've built but the same way you don't necessarily know how many loop devices you need. But I mean, binders different than loop devices in that this is a fixed system resource, um, and you're, you use binder only in a limited type of system. I mean, I understand you want to make it a, a more generic IPC, right? Is that the goal? Oh here? yeah, sure. I mean, uh, what's the what's the end? I mean, it, binders a very specific Android thing today. Do you want to make it a more generic? Yeah. Thing? Well, basically, yeah. So, for example, for these for these container use cases, it's uh, there are a bunch of people out there that want to run Android inside of a container, or that actually run Android inside of a container um, on a generic like AMD sixty four system uh, oh, or whatever. Yeah. Okay. And All right. so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know that's the world we live in. It's, I'm not saying that it's the greatest world ever, but yeah, this is, this is definitely happening. Like, there are solutions out there that allow you to do just that. Um, and I mean, to some extent, it's, it's similar to what Chrome OS is doing, right? I, I don't know what Chrome OS. I don't know how they oh. get around with that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, and, the third, and the third part is essentially that. Uh, uh, you have no per, per IPC name, so you have no. They're basically all of those uh, IPC devices that you can use always belong to to your initial IPC namespace, um, which is different from other IPC mechanisms. For example, another example is def MQ, MQ essentially and def uh, sham M. Uh, they both are mountable per IPC namespace, so they're separate file systems, um, and they have a different IPC namespace attached to the devices. So that's the whole idea. So this is the problem space, and I think I need to hurry up a little. Um, so basically, there is uh, three. There are two solutions, I'd say roughly. Uh, so if the first one is the patch set that we're seeing right now. Um, it's you attach in a new IPC namespace and open. So imagine you handing off a, a binder device to a process that runs in a different IPC namespace. You call open on it, and then a new IPC namespace gets attached to it. Uh, which sounds reasonable as a first approach. The problem is that this is unprecedented in, in the kernel as far as I know. There is nothing inside the kernel that changes namespace based on open, and I've just come up with a weird exploit, but basically there is one right here. If you send a binder FD into a, a different namespace, IPC namespace, and you reopen it through proc pit FD binder, you're now switching the namespace, as at least in the current implementation. Yeah, exactly, and it's like, I, I, I really don't want this. Um, uh, the Second one is, uh, this is related to the dynamic binder allocation problem. You could do it similar to what uh, you do with loop control. You call an open on a loop control, like what Kai did back in the days. You call an open on uh, binder loop control and you dynamically allocate a new binder device. And then you can use UDEF to rename the binder device to whatever you want, uh, basically. Um, and I think one solution that I would like, and I would like to hear input on in this, is if you sort of do it like, uh, MQ and Dev Shadmem. You do a binder FS essentially. It's mountable in different IPC namespaces. Uh, and when you mount it anew, you just have a, a binder loop control device, but no binder devices. And then a process inside of a different IPC namespace can just call open on the device. And the advantage is that uh, the IPC namespace is fixed to, the, like, to this mount. It's, it doesn't change, it's actually attached to the device. Yeah. Okay. okay, it's crazy, but you like it? That's, that, that's good. <laughs> this is it's going to addi add additional work to systems today, right? Because it's, it's not about backward compatible. Sorry? It's not backwards compatible. Oh, that's what I, we, I've totally been thinking about this, uh, and I'm not saying <laughs> I've solved this problem. Okay. But one of, the, one of the ideas is that basically you make it a config option at first. You say, this is opt-in. Like, if you want to like, have, have binder FS, then yes. If you don't want to have binder FS, then totally up to you. Then we just set up, basically set it up like it used to be before. And uh, yeah, and this gives you a long time to actually switch, because Todd was making it very clear, any solution that we come up with, it must be backwards compatible. Yeah, yeah. 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 What, what do you think of this? No. Well, as long as it doesn't mess up the device use case, I'm fine with it. <laughs> How do you plan to handle the, the security hooks in these cases? Because Finder, <coughs> the, the device nodes, uh, they have meaning in Android use space, for example, with what is supposed to be a window binder, what is supposed to be uh, hardware binder versus what is the normal binder, and based on that, there are there are there's there's policy in user space which decides what processes can do with those nodes. Well, if we are dynamically creating those nodes, okay. how does that work? So, so you need some. SC, sort of SC Linux can handle that. 
Yeah. Because it's a file system access. So you write an SE Linux rule based yes. on the name. Yes, That's but how does user space know which one is which? But if you're dynamically creating them. Sorry, what? So you need some sort of capability checker. Well, it's user space within that container. So it it's a yeah. container. Names. It's a cardboard binder. It, 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 picks, the, it it's picks the name. User space, mm -hmm. pick the name. In the binder control. In that can, yeah. 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 Thanks. Oh, and by the way, I have really shitty ears. I'm sorry, so you need to speak loud. Uh, so one thing that came up in one of the original patch sets was whether we could also use IPC namespaces to basically have the individual devices, like we could use IPC namespaces for, you know, binder, hardware binder, vendor binder, because that's also kind of like they're right now three separate devices. Um, but I think it's not possible for a process to be part of multiple IPC namespaces. Is that correct? Uh, with this solution? Yeah. Oh, I think it actually is. So you basically, use, you, you, what you want is, uh, for example, a container to still see services on the host, right? Uh, on, in a different IPC namespace. Yeah, I mean, it's that way so in Android. Well, yeah. Yeah, so what I would do in this situation is basically you could bind mount the device node from a different IPC mount into the namespace, into the different IPC namespace. And the thing is, uh, this works in contrast to the open solution is because the namespace is attached to the actual device node and not, uh, not doesn't get switched on open. Okay. Yep. But if you do this, if you do an open, you can pass that file descriptor off to some other namespace across the socket and everything will just work, yeah. right? Exactly. So I, I think you should be, it should help solve that problem there. Exactly. That's, yeah. Either bind mount a device node in there so the process can just open the device node yeah, or, or it's the, the file descriptor. descriptor. Exactly. But it's not, it doesn't switch. Like that's my whole, so my point is essentially I want to make very, very sure that uh, the IPC namespace or whatever label is attached to the actual K object basically or to the, to the device node essentially such that it, you cannot change it. User space should not be able to switch namespaces with like, with open syscall. That's crazy. So will this solve your issue of containers? Of you'll only Definitely. mount this per container? Yeah. A new one? And then but you're not it's not an IPC namespace, it's a it's a mount namespace. Uh it's well it's it's mountable per IPC namespace. Uh, so it's attached to an IPC namespace. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with a mount namespace, as far as I know. Uh, so MQ is doing ex the exact same thing. So um, MQ will refuse to, well, MQ is mountable in the same namespace again, but it's going to be, has the same IPC namespace, so it sees the same devices. It's the same with the dev PTS mounts. You mount them again. Yeah. But yeah. You know what, don't, PTS I never emulate PTS. I know. <laughs> I, no, I know. We learned too much. We've learned I've, more. I've seen so many bugs and I've fixed yeah, so no, many. No, no. It's crazy, yeah. But it's the, gen it's, it's, the idea is kind of similar. You switch in a new IPC namespace, you mount it, and then it's your new instance. You could even, if, if you want to be super crazy, uh, and the privileges are the same between two different IPC namespaces, you could also just bind mount the whole directory of, uh, uh, of a different um, binder FS instance into the diff other IPC namespace. Then you even share the, uh, the binder loop control device between yes, namespaces. Yeah. And then all of the namespaces share can share these, the services that you are running. Okay. So your last option, dedicated major number, you don't need, to, it's, everything can be dynamic because cool. you're just going off namespaces yeah. and names yeah. and you'll be fine. You don't Excellent. need a dedicated number. Okay. Um, I don't think you need it. Do you want a dedicated number for your, no, because your binder FS will create the binder control node on yeah. it automatically, so yeah. you don't care. Okay, so I, I really don't care. It's no. just that I, I don't, yeah, I wasn't sure. Okay. Four minutes. Four minutes or one minute? Four minutes. Okay. Four. Can you, can you say something about the, the use case, why Android in containers, what is the Oh, right. So basically, basically one of the ideas is uh, that you, I think it's a streaming solution. So basically you run, uh, you run Android in a container and then you abstract the way that you stream down uh, the end, like graphics and so on to handheld devices. Uh, that's basically the idea. Uh, and I think there is a bunch of different people working on this. Um, Right. So I'm not the one working on this. So uh, my knowledge about this is quickly converges to zero. But um, uh, I know a bit about namespaces. So uh, yeah. So there are commercial solutions out there actually using this kind of thing. Uh, Hatch runs a, a game server um, on Qualcomm ARM servers. Uh, 
Huawei is actually running a similar thing now. How do they do it? How do they petition it now? How do they handle this? There's a set of patches that uh, aren't going to ever go upstream. <laughs> Can we build on them? I think this is a much better way. Yeah, so it's, um, I work on with Christian. Um, there's only so, many, so much detail we can give publicly, but we are working with those different companies. I couldn't even we've, if I wanted to, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> we, like, we, we do have very, very similar use cases, and we've been working with some of those. Um, similar thing, we like use Qualcomm servers, and we run 200 Android containers on those machines, uh, each of them having two binder devices. What we do right now is we actually use the uh, binder devices option uh, on the kind of command line to create, I think, about 250 or whatever devices hard coded. And then the container manager will bind mount those as dev binder in the different containers. That kind of works, but it's very wasteful because it's not allocated dynamically. There's no way to clean stuff up. Um, it's, it's potentially. It's got a bunch of problems, and we would much rather the containers themselves be able to mount binder FS than allocate those binder devices on demand. Uh, because we don't know, and Android used to just use one binder device that's been changed. It might change again. We don't know how many we need to create or already, and we don't necessarily know. Um, like it's we don't, as far as the container manager, we don't know what the container is going to be doing. We don't know how many binder devices it's going to need. Right. So it's much better if it can allocate its own thing. It's also not nice that uh, they all share. If, if I, basically, they communicate via the same IPC namespace, which I, which is not wise from a security, uh, from a security perspective. I mean, it would be much better if you're already running in a separate IPC namespace <coughs> by default. So please also use devices that have the same IPC namespace. I just wanted to make a quick comment. I think it's a good idea to have dynamic binder creation. I think that's a good idea by itself. Uh, as, assuming we can solve whatever problems arise from that. But I wanted to make this statement. Uh, from the point of view of Android security, uh, containers are not security boundaries. They're just accounting boundaries. So um, whoever is trying to run Android in containers, that can never be compliant as far as our tests are concerned. So just be aware of that. Uh, I, 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 as I said, I cannot say anything to the use case. I'm probably pretty sure that these people that actually do this don't care about this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that may be so. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 15 seconds. Uh, yeah, exactly. One, one, two, well, you can have some security boundaries with user namespaces, but that gets you, yeah. I know what you're saying. Cheers. All right. Thank you very much. Somebody have a second one of these? Okay, you can keep it. He's going to have one more. <laughs> Hi, so my name is Patrick Bellasi, and I work for ARM as part of the power team. And uh, we work mainly on the energy aware scheduler. And this is to present one of the tools that we use within ARM to evaluate patches and modification. And the goal is to try to collect feedbacks in order to understand what, how we can make it more usable for the community, this, uh, this tool. So the problem essentially is that uh, um, when we push changes to, uh, to get it, uh, we do quite a lot, we spend quite a lot of time on reviewing them and check that the code is fine and whatever. But uh, usually, probably Google can run some verification in their CI loop, but at least the results are not exposed uh, outside. And there are not really um, results that report power performance uh, trade-off uh, for the changes that are proposed. And of course, when, when we are looking at contribution that affects some of, the, um, some of the power and performance framework, like the scheduler or power management frameworks or power R and whatever, we would really like to know what is the impact both on performances and power uh, when we apply those changes, possibly before applying the changes, but even if, if the changes are applied to try to highlight possible defects or things that we can try to improve in the future for, uh, for the target. <coughs> so in general, it would be really nice to have a, a tool which is freely available for people that just push their own uh, modification and can try to get some kind of feedback on what they are, uh, the impacts. And, uh, and also another problem is we have to identify a set of uh, reasonable benchmarks that everybody agree that are usable as a reference to verify the quality of, um, of patches that we send. So one of the <coughs> possible solutions is these tools that we develop within HARM. The idea is that uh, uh, you have a set of changes that you want to apply on top of a, of a kernel. So you can list at the SHA-1 of the patches that you want to test. You have a reference kernel. 
and uh, this, uh, uh, this script will take care to uh, compile uh, and flash uh, a target device which each one of those uh, kernel listed here. And for every kernel that you compile and boot the device, uh, then uh, we, we hand over the device to workload automation, which is another standard tool that use a reference agenda. So this reference agenda provides a, a very well-defined set of uh, use cases and benchmark real applications to be executed on the target device and collect results in a predefined format. All the results end up in a, in a folder. Uh, this is done for every single kernel or patch that we want to test. And then there is a final tool that basically generates a report that allows us to easily compare the, um, uh, the different kernels in terms of the different metrics that we, we collect. So there, I have an example here. Let me see if, can, if I can open it just to give you a quick view of what we get. So the, the output can be different formats, but basically let's assume it's like a, um, an, HTML, uh, an HTML document. And uh, for example, in this case, we are comparing two different kernels. Um, this specific case is a, a, is a patch set containing the most recent uh, ES uh, series of patches uh, with respect to the standard kernel. And uh, you get uh, a predefined set of output formats. So it makes it really easy for people that knows this format to see what are the, the effects. You get both numbers or plots to evaluate. In this case, uh, it's like a, a performance matrix, so the time required to generate uh, uh, a frame. Uh, you notice also that we, we run many iterations, so by default it's like 30 iterations for every test, and we compare uh, the results for all those uh, iterations to have some kind of statistical significant results. Uh, and we do this for many different uh, workloads that have been defined to be interesting. We have different kind of plots that allow us to better highlight behavior, like in this case it's always the frame generation time, but uh, we can see that there are behavior that are maintained, but we go faster with one kernel with respect to another. And, uh, and so on for all the different workloads. And we have also resuming results at the end where we see what are uh, the different uh, like energy or performance impact in percentage that we have uh, comparing the baseline kernel with respect to the patch that are uh, proposed. And this can be done for multiple different um, uh, kernels. So if I go back to my presentation, which is uh, this one. Uh, we have a pretty simple uh, energy measurement setup. We use an Acme Cape uh, uh, board. Uh, all this setup is really $100, $150. It can be, it's really designed to be used on desk for, uh, for single developers. Uh, and some reference board. So you can really collect the power and performance uh, measurements out of this, uh, out of this tool. Uh, the problem is that right now this is just a set of guidelines for us. So we have the tools, uh, they are there, and we can uh, teach people how to use them. Uh, we would like to understand if it's possible somehow to have uh, some kind of automation going on on top of, these, uh, on top of tools like those ones. So these are some of the discussion points. I would like to collect feedbacks uh, today uh, about these tools. And so the, the really first idea is, uh, uh, okay, do you think we can make this tool more usable by integrating it somehow or providing it in a more easily, um, in a more easily way, or um, which kind of devices we should uh, consider as a reference. We usually use uh, IK960 or Pixel devices, but uh, maybe some other solution is possible. And uh, again, um, sometimes it's uh, the set of benchmarks to be used. Uh, uh, some people care more about some workloads with respect to other. We would like to know if we have to uh, put attention into integrating other workloads. I think that it's pretty important to distinguish workloads uh, that targets interactivity, like junk bench or, or energy efficiency, so evaluating like how much we are energy efficient in playing back audio or videos or just sitting in the home screen, and performance bench, like PC Mark and Geekbench. <coughs> Maybe other options are, uh, um, that can be suggested. So yeah, basically, is there any feedback about this kind of framework? So we are using part of this solution in our program management working group. So not the compilation and the, we are using mainly so the workload automation and the, and the agenda to make some power consumption measurement and the LISA post processing. But all the previous parts we are using our CI loop and so on. And how do you get, like, how do you trigger this kind of test? Uh, so each time someone push a new commit in his dev branch, we are creating a new 
branch which merge all our ongoing dev, which trigger a comp a comp automatically a new compilation. So these are Git repositories that lead yeah. our manage. Okay. And once the build is finished, we trigger Lava Job based on uh, the workload automation and the Lisa post processing stuff. And results are available, uh, and we can look. Them. So we are we are not compare uh, we um, we are not doing this final uh, graphic comparison, but all the results are available. Yes, on some web interface. Okay. Yeah, I guess uh, just some feedback would be: um, <coughs> Do you measure like different power states too? Like, for example, like suspend. Uh, because uh, uh, on, on the next slide, I saw really just like benchmarks. Yeah, so the idea is to run like black box testing using real application like Jenkins and uh, or PCMark or whatever. And we measured at the battery power uh, level. So we measured the overall system energy consumption for a, for a device. We don't really care. We have other kind of tests that digs down into the details of different contribution. But in this specific case for this tool, what we want to see is that in the main domains of interactive workloads, uh, energy efficient workloads, and performance workloads, we don't have regressions or notable difference. But so I, I guess these are all just active workloads and nothing like, you know, your bottom power of suspend, basically in your screen off mode, suspend. And with workload automation, you have some use case which, which is called the idle use case, where you can set screen off or screen on, for example. And there is no support for suspend to run, for example, yet. But we are looking at that. So do you think it can be interesting to have more detailed energy <coughs> measurement? Because sometimes the, the concern from people is that they don't want to see uh, real energy measurements from a target board, especially if you post a, a contribution on Gerrit where you, were, you tested on one specific device, maybe an internal device. You don't want to disclose real numbers. That's actually one of the concerns that we collected so far. So the idea to keep anonymized results where that's one of the concerns sometimes. How difficult is it to integrate new devices or new workloads? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. So we have a, a kind of an abstraction where you have to provide, uh, basically, at this <coughs> level, you have to provide few scripts, uh, bash scripts, that uh, tells exactly how to build an image for one specific device, and provided you have the compilation products for, for that device, how to flash them on that device by rebooting the device. It's just a bash script, so the abstraction is there. I mean, the engine is just calling these scripts, and provided you know how to script in bash. Uh, flashing of a device, it should be reasonably simple. Um, so, one question, I, I, this all looks really cool. Um, in some of the work that I've done with workload automation, one of the gotchas I see is quite often the tests aren't really publicly available. Um, so things like Jankbench isn't something that you can just easily find and, you know. Um, it's is, in OSP now. Oh, okay, that's good. Um, so yeah, but I was trying to see, I know Steve Muckle a couple of years back had gone through some efforts trying to create kind of a more open set of tests. Yeah. Has there been any effort to try to do that as well? Uh, I think it's exactly working on the same direction. Is uh, These things has evolved across time and is now what it is right now, but actually we are reusing pieces that was already there. We are actually using workload automation with all the things that it provides. The only thing is that like we want to try to standardize things, like define which workloads you have uh, potentially to run and provide results in a standard form in such a way that everybody that knows more or less this language, let's say, can easily see if a patch gives some kind of benefit or not uh, in terms of yeah. power performance. Yeah. It's just reproducing them if you don't have access to those benchmarks is the concern, I guess. And maybe that's yeah. not a big issue for most vendors. Yeah, well, in principle, it would be nice if you can just post uh, things on Gerrit and somehow within Google a machine, or uh, maybe the Linaro approach is also working. Uh, just transparently, there is a set of predefined devices where you can collect power performance results and you know you have the report there. You don't have to install anything at that point. Four minutes. So you, you are using only one single agenda to run everything? What, one single what? You, you have one agenda where you are running yeah. all the tests. Uh, yeah, so there is one uh, reference agenda that we use for scheduler-related things. Yeah. 
uh, but potentially you can use whatever you want. Uh, um, so it's one boot and you're running all the tests in one single sequence. Have you think about rebooting the board? Because we have discovered some in interaction. I mean, if you're running, for example, some Velamo test and with some junk bench on idle or idle test, you can see some impact of the Velamo test in the idle and junk bench results. So yeah. maybe that would be good to be able to reboot between each single. Yeah, that's thing. an option of WA. Uh, I'm not actually sure if we have this option set or not, yeah. if we reboot every time. I don't think we reboot, at least not between the iteration of the same test, maybe between different tests there is a reboot, but it's eventually one option to be added on top of that. Uh, and actually, yeah, the good point is that in general, testing patches is always, if everybody comes up with all its own recipe, you have to spend time trying to understand how to fix things and make them yeah. working. If there should be something that is a kind of solution available somewhere, you can just push patches and see the comparison that would be really very, very useful. Paul Lawrence, I'm uh, part of the Android kernel team, and this is Daniel, who's Daniel Rosenberg, who's also part of the Android kernel team. Um, <clears throat> we've been asked to work on the problem of updates, uh, making updates smoother. This presentation, the next presentation, will both be about that. Um, the specific problem we were looking at. Let me move forward the slide. Um, we have we had we've had a system of AB updates since I keep forgetting. I think it's N. Um, doesn't really matter. Whereby we put down, as, we, as you probably all know, we have A, A and B slots for system and, um, and vendor and, and boot. Put down the new ones next to the old ones, reboot off the new ones. Um, and if we get all the way through boot complete, we mark the new slot as, as good, and then we can boot off the new slot from then on. And if it fails three times, typically, three times always, three times normally, then we um, roll back and go back to the old one. And that works pretty well, but the problem is once the new Partitions start modifying user data, um, and then we will. And if, if there's a crash after that point, and we roll back, we're using the old system vendor boot image with the new user data, or at least with a halfway house new user data, which is probably even slightly worse. Um, and that is not a supported situation. There's no reason why it should work. Um, so um, basically, we need some form of way of rolling back user data. I mean, clearly, AB user data makes no sense at all. That would be stupid. But, um, so what's needed is some form of checkpointing. And by the way, we tend to use checkpointing and snapshots interchangeably. Forgive us for that. Um, <laughs> they, they mean the same thing as far as we're concerned. OK. Um, so there are two basic approaches to this problem. Um, if, if the file system supports, if the file system you have on user data supports checkpoints or snapshots, then you're pretty much home and dry. There's a few. At least from a kernel point of view, there's some um, API issues, but that's not actually our department. Um, so the trouble is none of the file systems we tend to use on user data actually support checkpoints, or did support checkpoints. But first, here's Daniel to talk about how we fixed that. So, uh, I worked on adding uh, checkpointing into uh, F2FS, the uh, flash-friendly file system. So um, for those of you that aren't too familiar with the internal structures, I put a uh, little diagram of uh, the basic on-disk structure. And there is a nice uh, checkpointing section. And the uh, way that uh, F2FS uh, works is it is periodically updating that checkpoint which indexes into like, what parts of the other metadata are currently relevant. And the uh, general gist of the feature is that we stop generating new checkpoints for some period of time. And uh, this is currently like, uh, controlled as like a mount option. Then you would remount and resume checkpointing. 
And the uh, end result of that is that anything that you do, uh, if you happen to like unmount or crash or anything in between uh, mounting with that uh, option and uh, remounting to turn that option off, you would effectively not have any of those changes persist. So the uh, patches for this have already gone in as of uh, for, uh, 420. And uh, the I guess, biggest performance change currently is just in the mounting itself. So in order to keep some of the uh, guarantees that we need to be uh, running smoothly, we need to do a certain amount of uh, garbage collection up front because without, uh, without having access to checkpointing, there is only so much garbage collection that we can do once this feature is uh, turned on. <coughs> so as long as we have done the amount of garbage collection we need to up front, we can run as long as we need to in this mode without having any uh, major like any like real performance impact as we're running as we normally would. So yes, uh, any uh, questions about that part? Any questions put in now? Okay, so that deals with the problem um, pretty thoroughly when we have the F2FS. Um, unfortunately, we, well, we, we don't specify the file system with Android. Um, I believe the majority of devices still use ext 4 I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, and that's not going to change anytime soon. And there may be other file systems out there too. So we need a system that will work when the file system does not itself support checkpointing. Um, just before we go down what I actually did, what I actually did um, really at that point there's two things you can do. You can go above the file system and look at using something like OverlayFS, or you can go below the file system and work at the block layer. Um, we evaluated OverlayFS. It's promising, and there's actually some interesting work um, that I was brought to my attention which might make OverlayFS useful in the future. At this point in time, OverlayFS does not play well with SE Linux. Um, so it's not that suitable for an Android solution. Um, so the, the decision was made to work at the block level. Um, so the obvious question at the block level is why not use DM Snap? DM Snap exists, it works, it's great. Um, it does snapshots, um, and it requires an external volume. So there's your answer. If there's no external volume in Android, there's no way we could put one. Um, DM Snaps seems to be dead in the water. Um, but we were thinking about this, and we realized that if we knew where the empty space was on, the unused space was on user data, we could find some way of using that to store the snapshots. Um, so what we did was we came up with a, a new driver, which I'm calling DM Bow. Name is provisional. Bow stands for backup on the right. Um, uh, oh, oh, sorry, there was one thing I wanted to bring up. When, when I tried to upstream DM Bow, I got some suggestions from the, the DM Snap maintainers. Um, one of the ideas they had was to create a file on user data um, before you reboot, I think. Actually, no, before you start snapshotting. And then extract the, using FindMap to extract the blocks from that, the location of blocks in that file. Um, and, then and then use DM Linear to use that device, that, that file as a device which you could then access below the file system as a storage for your DM snap. Um, that, would, uh, that would work, I'm, I'm confident it would work but it would only give you half the available space for storage because, because, it, because that's what it would do. It would, you're backing up to it, you've lost half the space. Um, so um, I don't think that works for us. Space is, we, freeing up more user data to take an update is not, not a good idea on Android. We can only want to free up as, much, as, as little as we have to. Um, so I, I, the idea was we dynamically detect, uh, so I developed this device whose idea is use the free blocks on the, on the driver as the storage space. So first of all, we need to identify the free blocks, which we do by um, running a trim on the file system, which issues trims through the DM layer, which we, which we capture. Um, and then we basically, all future writes, we look at what they're writing over. If it's original data, we make sure we back it up into one of those free, free blocks. Um, and then, of course, we keep a log of that so that when we, if we want to roll back, we can. 
Um, this means that the, that the forward path is, is very clean. We've only written over the three areas, so if we want to go forwards, we simply, we simply stop doing it, basically. We simply stop writing anything else down. Um, and given that's the 99% case, i.e. update works, that should be all we have to do. Um, but it's possible from the log and the blocks in the free data to roll back after a reboot if you have to. Um, it's efficient, it uses all the space available, no, no problems there. Um, and it's, it works. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, questions? How much uh, extra free space do you require to be able to do checkpointing <coughs> on update? Uh, so uh, uh, both, sy both systems are as efficient as you could expect them to be. As in, if you, if you create a new file, it's a, no, no difference. If you overwrite 100 megabytes of a file, we have to keep a copy of the original data, either with Daniel or my solution. So it's 100 megabytes of space needed for that operation. So basically, overwrites is one for one. Um, new files, free. OK. And like, if I change like one byte, would I, would I be basically like saving a page or a block? Or what, what's the granularity? For, for the block solution, oddly enough, it's a block. <laughs> uh, so I believe it would be like um, probably around page size. It would just be like uh, it would be pretty much the way that uh, F2FS would be working uh, normally. So you know, we end up uh, a lot of the times with uh, F2FS. It tries to group all the uh, writes together, so things can end up moving as you go. So all of that continue working, continues to work as it would be, apart from it not being allowed to write to the blocks that it needs for the previous checkpoint. OK. Five minutes. Um, so I, I recently added snapshot support two kernels ago to the SME3 SIFS driver. Which file system supports snapshots today? I mean, other than mine, other than SMB3, but I cheat because every NAS device supports it, so I'm just, I'm not having to do the hard work. You're having to do the hard work. I think ButterFS started. Yeah, that's not that specific. Yeah, ButterFS is not the one we use generally. Yeah, so I guess kind of when I'm stepping out 10,000 feet, I, there's no infrastructure like there is in every other operating system to like, open a previous version, right? There's like open flags to open previous versions in every other operating system. So what I do is on mount, I have a parm that says snapshot and a timestamp. And it's really ugly because you got to know the timestamp. But is there any infrastructure like a tool, a user space thing I should plug into? Because then ButterFS and SMB and whoever, whatever you do, would have the same tool so you didn't have to remember weird file system specific stuff. Yeah, so for the, um, this F2FS uh, checkpointing thing is a very, I guess, lightweight version of it. It doesn't give you the, uh, well, as I mentioned right now, it doesn't give you the option to uh, switch back and forth between them. It's more of a, uh, you can set it in a mode where you can go back if you need to. I force you to be read only. Hmm? I force read only on a snapshot. Yeah, I mean, we didn't, we didn't attempt to, to um, engineer a full snapshot solution here with multiple snapshots, ability to read from old ones. We were very focused on the problem, which is if things go wrong, we need to roll back to the old state. And that was the only problem we tried to solve. So these solutions are not intended to be you know, a, 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 an equivalent of a full, a full snapshotting solution that, like, you might, like you're talking about, where you can open old versions of files and restore individual files and all that kind of nice stuff. We don't have any of that nor do we particularly plan to implement it. Because our problem is rather, it's very focused, which is rolling the whole thing back in one fell swoop um, when things go wrong. Well, I, I was just going to add to it. I, I think uh, basically, the is basically the snapshot Andy, is. Andy. Uh, the snapshot is exactly one version old and never more than that, and the reason for that is because we always wanted the ability to automatically roll back if something goes wrong. So nothing has to intervene and do anything to the file system because the biggest use case is if, is if update is wrong, we don't want to leave the user data 
with the wrong update. We want to we want it to roll back automatically. So uh, the role in this case is or uh, the responsibility is to the caller or to, for on Android in order to commit the snapshot. So basically, ultimately, you never have more than one. That was and and we wanted an automatic rollback when you do reboot because that reboot can happen anytime and we have no control over it. I mean, the reboot is probably because the device crashed. It's, it's not a good reboot. <laughs> so, the, an example I was thinking of. Let's say you, you did your presentation and you screwed up. Probably so, not. I mean, I did a presentation, I screwed up, right? So, what I was trying to see if there's any commonality in what you're talking about, what ButterFS does, what, S, what, what I now do in SMB3. So, you screwed up your presentation. Today, all you'd have to do in SMB3, in my kernel driver, right, in the kernel FS, is just mount snapshot to some directory, and then you could just do diffs between your your yeah, no, no, I, mean, I, know, I know what you're saying, but that, yeah. that's what a full snapshot solution should yeah. do. Uh, I'm, we have not implemented a full snapshot solution. We have implemented just, a, just a, a, whole, yeah. a, a limited solution which allows us to roll back everything. Um, yeah. uh, that's super useful. I'm, I'm not saying it's not useful. But what I was getting at is that you know, the APIs for that are more complicated in my case, simpler in your case. But um, I could do that too, by the way, if it helps. But I'm sure you could. <laughs> but the, the thing that's, that's interesting is I thought the most common use case is like you screw up a presentation, you're looking at a diff and trying to find the previous version of a single file that you screwed up. Um, does, so ButterFS is the only guy, XFS, you know, in the, in the old DMAPI days, there's no, there's no other file system other than VTRFS uh, that today would allow you to do something vaguely similar. So there's no user space tools. I'm not aware of. I think there's ZFS. Sorry. ZFS, I think, has snapshots. We got one minute. So he's been waiting patiently. Yeah. yeah, I've got a quick question on the DM snap. Uh, were you able to set it up in the lab? Because uh, when I tried to test DM snap, and I was trying to snapshot an uh, ext4 block device, mounted block device, and uh, it looks like DM snap tries to uh, lock the device exclusively. So I was not able to snapshot mounted uh, ext4 block device. So I had to unmount it and then uh, use another block device. That's true. Uh, and then, then I was able to snapshot and use the DM snap to do a snapshot. So uh, my question is, uh, does DM snap can actually snapshot a mounted uh, partition? No, I mean DM snap That's creates a second device, and then well actually two more devices, and then you mount on, mount those devices. DM snap does do yeah, what we uh, need. The problem we had is that DM snap requires an extra device, which we don't have, yeah. and I think we're being turfed okay. off. Uh, Fifteen seconds. seconds. Okay. Yeah. The file system thinks it writes. Exactly the same Here you go. Uh -huh. DM Snap is 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 an has its own LVM. It, mm -hmm. The file system thinks it writes exactly the same block, and DM Snap says no, okay. you're actually writing to another block. That, that was the problem. So, that was, uh, yeah. All right. So it exclusively owns the. Exactly. exactly. That's that's the problem. So I'll let you guys continue this afterwards. Thank you guys. Right. Thanks. My name is uh, David Anderson. I work at Google on the Android team. Uh, so one of Android's big updatability problems is that after a few years, we start to run out of space to update devices. Um, so normally devices uh, have over-provisioned partitions, and they're all, um, most of Android, unlike a desktop operating system, resides in read-only partitions. So in this sample device here with this partition table, uh, the system partition has been allocated at two gigs. But maybe uh, the initial image on it is only 1.5. And the manufacturer doing that, let's say they want three years of updates, they have to hope that that extra 500 uh, megs of slack is enough for those three years. And unfortunately, these partitions run out of space at different rates. So almost always, at least on Pixel, system runs out of space long before vendor does. Uh, so let's say after three years, uh, system is completely full, and uh, this vendor partition has 200 megs free. Uh, we can't actually take that space from vendor to use for system, and that's because each partition is signed and verified, and they may be signed by different providers or vendors. So an obvious uh, solution to this is why not just rewrite the GPT? If you're not familiar, GPT is the GUID partition table. And it's the fixed partition layout uh, used on most modern devices and, and desktops. And there are already tools for this, like Gparted, that can uh, resize and move partitions and, and uh, write a new GPT. 
Uh, there's two reasons we don't want to do this. One is that Android doesn't specify a partitioning system. Even though GPT is super popular, uh, we don't require that devices use it. And second is that it's just inherently risky. Uh, we don't want to risk user data becoming completely inaccessible due to an over-the-air update. So our solution for this uh, was to use Device Mapper. So instead of having individual fixed partitions for a system, product, and vendor, we now have one big fixed partition called Super. And within that, we use Device Mapper to allocate logical partitions. You'll notice that in this diagram, there's a few partitions that are uh, still fixed, like the boot partition. Uh, that has to stay uh, a fixed partition because it has the kernel. And user data uh, is also fixed. We just uh, don't want to touch that. So Super is uh, mostly for read-only uh, partitions. So the implementation for this is uh, pretty similar to LVM or GPT. At the top of the super partition, there's a little chunk of metadata uh, that describes partition names and what regions of the disk they occupy. And unlike GPT, uh, these regions can be, uh, these partitions can be fragmented. So when your, uh, your initial device layout may have system and vendor, each occupying one region of the disk. But after an OTA, let's say an over-the-air update uh, decides to resize the system partition, we don't actually move vendor and make a contiguous uh, region for system. Uh, we instead add a second chunk of the disk uh, to the um, uh, metadata for system. And this maps really nicely to Device Mapper. Uh, the DM linear, DM linear module uh, lets us just string together uh, random um, uh, regions of block devices. We had to change a few aspects of the boot sequence to make this work. Um, previously in Android P, uh, we would skip in RAMFS, and the kernel would boot directly to the system partition. We can't do that anymore because the kernel doesn't actually understand our partitioning system. It can't find the system image. So instead, we now have a RAM disk in the boot partition, and there's a first stage init in there that reads the super partition metadata and uh, creates our device map for devices. And we had to change our FS tab mounting code uh, so it could find those partitions as if, they, as if they were in the GPT. Over the air updates can now uh, resize, create, delete these dynamic partitions. They don't have to touch GPT. Uh, this is all handled in a, a user space by a library called libLP, that is an AOSP. Another thing we had to change is uh, how devices are flashed. So previously, uh, devices, most devices were flashed from the bootloader using a confusingly named protocol called Fastboot, but obviously bootloaders do not have device mapper, they don't run the Linux kernel. Uh, so we needed a, a user space solution to this. So now uh, devices that need to flash dynamic partitions, um, they will actually boot into a uh, recovery image of the Linux kernel and start a daemon called Fastboot-D. And this is obviously too slow for fa flashing the factory. Uh, we don't want to sit there booting up devices uh, on the factory <coughs> line just to flash them. Uh, so we can also pre-generate an image of the super partition. Uh, we found Device Mapper was super flexible. Uh, we had already been using DM Verity. It uh, just stacked on top of uh, our new logical partitions. That continued to work. Uh, we also found we can retrofit older devices. Um, so even if a device doesn't have a super partition, it doesn't really matter because DM Linear lets us stitch uh, uh, any device uh, into a, a logical partition. Um, so we can uh, uh, retrofit this to devices just by reusing the existing partition tables they have. We also did some performance measurement. We found there's uh, no measurable performance impact up to hundreds of extents in a partition. Uh, we did see uh, a measurable overhead once we got into thousands and tens of thousands. We're not expecting that to be a problem. Android has uh, one security update a month and one major dessert release a year. So you'd have to be updating a device for like 60 to 80 years before you hit uh, that sort of limit. And uh, a very common question is uh, why not LVM? Um, and mostly problem specific to Android. Um, uh, the first is we need to generate factory images. We need to be able to generate an image off the build uh, that we can just flash onto devices without actually generating the um, LVM metadata on the device. Our non-AV updates need to survive power loss. Uh, so for example, um, if you have a phone that is not an AV device and you're updating and you yank out the battery, we try very hard to make it so when you put the battery back in, uh, the update will continue uh, and resume. And um, if uh, 
Um, we're writing metadata. We want that. We want to preserve that property. Um, and lastly, we needed a quota mechanism for partition owners. Uh, we want the ability to, to have certain partitions owned by one vendor and other partitions owned by another and have a quota on how much space they're each allowed to, to have. And the easiest way to do that was to just encode, encode that quota inside the metadata. Questions? I didn't quite get your rationale for uh, why you didn't want to add user data to the, the set of partitions you could resize on the fly. So initially when we uh, set out to do this, we actually wanted to uh, uh, resize user data as part of that. So let's say um, um, you actually ran out of space in the super partition, we'd be able to start encroaching into user data. That turned out to be a huge can of worms for many reasons, and we backed off that. And just to, to uh, reduce the risk of um, of user data becoming uh, inaccessible or corrupted. We just kept it out, out for now. OK. Thank you. There was, a path, there was a path in the flow where there was a possibility that you would require a factory reset. And that's basically, for us, is a regression from what the current AB update behavior is. Uh, we don't know how how much or what the frequency of that path that happens, but we definitely intend to monitor and see what we can do about it. But yeah, so basically that was the risk to include user data. Uh, is, all, is all the changes available in ASP Master now for yes. the support? Yeah, is my question is this upstream? Yes. Yep. And so do you know if uh, the regular Linux distributions also pick up the user tools and all, all that, or it's just for Android? Just an AOSP, I think. Yeah, because it looks, <laughs> yeah, but did, do you know if it was adopted other than? Uh, if, if you, if, if, the, if the metadata format works for your distribution, most of the distribution is a for LVM. If the, the, the simpler metadata format uh, that we have and is something that you require because you're updating. Again, the update case is also unique to Android. In that case, the libraries are there. The metadata format we definitely intend to document and basically open up. Anyone is free to use it wherever they want. It's basically, ultimately, it's DM linear, which, ex which works exactly the same way everywhere. It's basically how do you get the metadata in the user space in order to configure DM linear. With LVM, it has its own format. We have the, our own metadata format, on disk metadata format. Five minutes. I just wanted to say, uh, we do know that some companies actually change the GPT on OTA, and we really ask them to not do that, please. But they, they do that, uh, and they say that they've never run into any problems, to which we say, well, how do you know if you didn't run into any problems, the device didn't boot. So that we really think that this is the better way forward. Just a comment. Sorry. All good? Early break. All right, so um, it's break time until 4. We'll start at 4 sharp. Thanks. Okay, my name is Sandeep Patel. I work in uh, Android kernel team. Uh, one of the reasons uh, we were talking about FSTAB and DTS is because of something that we did uh, back in uh, Android Oreo, for example, and we actually talked about it in the Plumers as well. And uh, what we did for Project Treble is when we wanted to split platform from uh, vendor implementation, which means we also wanted to make sure all the code that, uh, that is responsible for vendor and hardware part lives in the vendor partition, and, yet, and all the code that uh, is responsible for platform lives in a system partition. What that means was uh, we also wanted to make sure the SE Linux policy that goes and basically attributes every single one of them also is split across these two. 
So in order to be able to do that, that means we have to basically build the SE policy as we boot into Android, and we wanted to be able to source that SE policy from uh, both of these partitions, uh, assuming that one of them can get updated, particularly in platform. Uh, what that meant for init at the time was we wanted to make sure both of these partitions are available as soon as init has started. And that wasn't the case for, say, non-AB devices at the time. For AB devices, I think, um, system partition was being mounted as root, uh, but vendor partition was not guaranteed to be around. So our solution to that was that. Uh, what that is, is uh, basically a way for us to tell in it where to look for system and vendor partition. Uh, that way, so, uh, bef well, to retract a bit, before this, basically, it, was, it used to be a FS tab sitting in, say, system partition, uh, in it would then go and read the FS tab and then start mounting partitions as usual. Now that we need these partitions even before SE Linux policy is loaded, that means we don't have any file system to work off of, so, but we still need to get this information to in it somehow. Uh, so that somehow, at that time, turned out to be device tree. Uh, and that basically means we were locked to the device tree, which basically the feature at that time was called um, I mean, uh, early mount, <coughs> let's change its name, early mount, first stage mount, because the mount for system and window happens in, in its first stage. Uh, what you would see that is basically a device tree mind binding that basically reflect an FS tab entry for Android. <coughs> And uh, the things in bold there are basically what are vendor specific. For example, the SOC 62400 part is something that is vendor specific and you don't know that in advance. So it had to be hard coded in the device too, uh, which has caused a lot of grief because that means whenever you want to change anything, you have to basically flash uh, the kernel in order to be able to basically figure out where to mount from. And that has caused a lot of cross dependencies. Same thing basically continued on for verified boot 2.0, which basically use AVP. Uh, so we actually piled on to this method and added an AVP node to the de device rate ID, which is called VBMAP. What this is supposed to do as of uh, today is mention all the partition names without their slot suffix that are verified by AVP. Uh, the reason for that is again, in its would go and read this and make sure all of these partitions are verified using uh, libavb and make calls into libavb. Uh, the biggest part here, for example, boot, it's not even, there's not even a file system on it, but it is verified, it is part of the verified boot chain. Uh, the FS manager flag changed from, say, verify to avb. But, and there's one more thing that's not mentioned here, but it did happen is, the vendor specific part, the, the name, the SOC slash 62400, that also changed into basically a, a, a DT property called boot device, which is which is a way for any to tell which exact device to look for system and vendor partitions from, because there are reference devices that may have, say an EMMC and UFS, both have both system and vendor partition, and we need to know which ones to boot from. So the way to do that was, again, through device to well, uh, suffice it to say, we basically uh, made one change and we pretty much piled on it for the next two years in order to basically keep it moving. Uh, with Android P, however, there's one change that happened, which is uh, all Android Pi devices are now expected to have system to be mounted as root, doesn't matter whether it's AB or not AB. And with uh, David talk earlier, you saw we're, uh, we're trying to work on basically getting uh, logical partitions in shape, which means we have an opportunity here to basically get rid of all of these bindings from device tree and put them back into FS tab, which we think where they belong. Uh, and which that means the RAM disk comes back, which is what we're calling first stage RAM disk. All this means is um, the current init binary in Android already has two stages, first and second. But the first stage now gets executed out of this RAM disk, while the second stage gets pushed down to the system partition. Uh, we would, uh, we obviously want to maintain the property that the system is still the root file system for Android. So first stage partition, uh, first stage RAM disk, after it's done doing what it is supposed to do, which is mount partitions and load AC policy, <coughs> is going to switch root into a slash system and then everything, and then it never, uh, it is not seen ever. <coughs> FS tab um, doesn't have to be special FS tab for that root file system. We, I think we are planning to have a flag 
that tells which one of the partitions are to be mounted in this special first stage and which ones are not. Uh, it ends up unifying all treble, non-project treble con uh, configurations, removes entirely anything, any need to have anything in the device tray, including those VB meta configurations, because uh, we realize we actually don't need to re-verify boot partitions because it's verified by the bootloader in the first place. Uh, and basically, the FS tab doesn't have to be different for different partition. It can be the exact same FS tab that gets copied into, say, vendor, and as well as the first stage RAM disk. Just the FS manager flags can vary, and that decides which stage of any of those partitions get mounted. Uh, and lastly, the boot device part can go back to being passed by a kernel command line, which basically completely removes everything that we added in device 3, and that's what we plan to do. Uh, Last uh, but not the least, another thing that we are trying to do in our, around device trees is for Android, device trees were appended to the gzip kernel image for the longest of time. So bootloaders basically uh, unzip the kernel and then find the device tree appended to it and then run through them to find the device, uh, the, uh, the base DT that is applicable to the SSE. We are actually going to get rid of those patches that append this because what we ended up doing with Pi was we versioned the boot image header because boot image header was immut uh, immutable before because if a bootloader is carrying that, that particular header, then we didn't want to break any of them. So what we did last year was to version it. I think the boot image is at version one now. So we have an opportunity where we can put a device tree entry into boot image and call it version two. So, and we can, and then the bootloader can check for boot image to be, whether it's version one or two and then expect the device tree to be there. So from now onwards, we want the device trees to live there, which means the good side effect of it is it also gets rid of about eight to 10 patches just to append the device tree at the end of the kernel from that we've been maintaining. Uh, well that's at least the solution we have in mind, but we are open for suggestions. Anything else that you can think of, good, bad. All right, my coffee survived. Um, yeah, so I'm very excited for all this. I've been probably nagging a bit. <laughs> but uh, one of the things I've, I've been kind of bringing up occasionally is, is sometimes those paths that are very SOC specific. Um, again, have any thoughts or discussion on uh, using things like partition labels for systems or that sort of thing? So the, the partition names are not SOC specific, but it's basically the, the controller. The, the, the names come from the, the controller driver, and there is nothing we can do about it. So we, and it does go and create like uh, sim links which are by name, just like how UDEV would do. And that's exactly how everything is found right now, including the slots of it. But uh, yeah, we haven't really thought of standardizing how a device to be, is to be named. And I don't think it's in our position, I don't think we sh actually should even do that. Because uh, the, the configuration is vendor, every board is different, every SOC slash controller is different, and we don't necessarily want to standardize the name for it because that means how you register to the respective subsystem in the kernel changes because of that. Because we don't want to figure out, uh, one way or the other, you're gonna have to tell Android which one is, which is the device that you're looking for partitions for. Either you tell it through boot device or in order to create a standardized name. How you tell it is only the question. So if you have idea about Getting rid of boot device from command line, I'm all yours. I actually don't want anything on the command line. Yeah, I, mostly just thinking as if you use a partition label, then as they're discovered, they can be automatically matched. And this is how sometimes distros would, or, you know, enter, I don't know, I guess enterprise yes, distros do but it. But uh, there is the risk where you could have two devices that have the same partitions. Like an SD card has system partition, and an EMMC yeah. has system partition. But I'm not sure if the AVB might. Oh, that, that is why boot device still exists. Otherwise, there is no need. That's still a thing. So, for example, on, on a high keyboard, if you have SD card and with system and an internal, so we don't know which one to boot from. Okay, as long as they're both signed properly. Then I guess the question is why sure. would it matter? <laughs> well, and then there are those, well, I, I know. We, we got three minutes. All right. All right. A whole bunch of reference devices have two EMMC and UFS configurations too. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, now that you brought back the init RAM FS, have you looked into ways of freeing that memory or have you? Yes, uh, yeah. that gets freed before the, right after switch root. So the second stage takes care of that. Cool. Yes. 
that the that is the reason behind switching route completely and executing to the second stage. So there's not there's no leaks uh, in the first stage. So we never go, you can never go back. That's it? First wow. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh. Yeah, you can use that. All right. Okay. Thanks, Joel. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, our the work we have been doing with uh, getting trying to get Ashmem out of staging, uh, the plan that we have, uh, all the work that we did, and uh, the you know the the open questions and the problems that that we're dealing with. I think it's switched off. Okay. It's fine. So why do we want to do this? So uh, the thing about uh, the the Ashmem driver is it's uh, it's been in staging for so many years. Uh, things in staging are not Linux ABI. Uh, you know they can be deleted at any time. They're not expected to be supported, so it's not a good thing to to have it in staging. Uh, Ashmem is uh, it's it, by design it's uh, it's just like a wrapper layer on top of SHMEM, uh, and that design has had a lot of issues that we have seen recently, like. With uh, with locks and deadlocks and things like that, bugs keep coming up. Um, and then the third reason is, uh, you know, Linux systems already have MemFT, so we'd rather just use that and add features that are missing in that. Uh, it you know it's robust, widely tested. If I understand, it's actually been around longer than SH, uh, Ashmem, uh, and it's it's uh, very well integrated with the uh, core MM. Uh, uh, you know, subsystem in the in the kernel. So we we rather use that. <coughs> so the the roadmap uh, kind of looks like, you know, if we want to add missing features to MemFT, whatever we need, uh, send those patches upstream, remove use cases and user space that don't need Ashmem at all, uh, change the implementation in Android. So our plan is to keep the API in in the Android libraries uh, the same, but change the underlying implementation. To actually use MemFT instead of uh, instead of Ashmem, uh, and then we have to uh, look into the problem of uh, apps that don't use uh, the Android libraries and directly use Ashmem, uh, like like the Chrome browser. And so we have to look into uh, doing things like add, adding SE Linux rules and monitoring, auditing, and seeing who's using it and working with them to move away from it. And then finally, uh, you know, after everything is done, we can look into removing the driver from staging or something like that. <coughs> uh, so one of the features, actually the, the only feature that is missing uh, that we wanted in MemFT is for memory protection. So Android has this use case where you can uh, allocate a, a region of memory and send it across to another process. And when you before you send it, you can Set the protections for that region to uh, to be read only, so so that you can uh, so that the sender could continue to write to it, but the receiver will only get a read only uh, view of the of the memory region. Um, and so th uh, there's a a, a a class in in Android called cursor window, which uh, which needs this. Um, so patches for this uh, are completed, and uh, we. Uh, Sent them upstream uh, last week, and it's uh, it's looking good. It should get merged soon. Um, so this was the this was one of the other features that we thought initially um, uh, uh, MMFT might need, but it turns out that there's not a lot of people using pinning and unpinning. Um, in fact, the only user we have seen is is Chrome. Uh, so we're um, we're working with the Chrome teams to. Uh, to try to move away from it. On regular Linux, they don't even use Ashmem. They use other uh, other methods to do uh, what the pinning, unpinning interface 
was supposed to do. Um, and uh, <coughs> there are other issues with uh, pinning and unpinning. Uh, like, there's, um, it's not exactly a, a, a stable way of, of doing the doing what it's, it, it was intended to do. Uh, so, uh, so the, you know, work on that is ongoing with, uh, with Chrome moving away from it and stuff like that. And then the other uh, part in our roadmap has been how to remove use cases that don't need Ashmem. Uh, so I identified a use case uh, in, in the Android runtime that was uh, using it just for naming memory regions, not even for sharing memory. And so uh, I, I took that out and I made it use anonymous regions, which actually turned out uh, to be uh, saving kernel memory and was much faster actually to just use that. And to name those anonymous regions, we already have a patch uh, to, uh, in, our, in our kernel trees. That's not upstream to do that. Uh, it's a PRCTL. Uh, we will push that upstream soon. Um, so, once upstream and all, you know the kernel side of it is taken care of, uh, you know the next plan is to, as I, as I was saying, change the the Android libraries, the native libraries to use MemFD. Uh, this is what it would look like. The Android framework you would use the the the, li the library unchanged uh, at the interface level, but it would instead use MemFD instead of Ashman. Uh, and one of the big issues uh, is that uh, how do we deal with apps that don't uh, don't go through the libraries but directly access uh, Ashram? Um, so what can we do about that? So one of the solutions is 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 first to study the problem uh, by adding SE Linux rules and auditing and seeing who who's using it. Um, and uh, yeah, so we work with, uh, with, with whoever is using them directly in this way and have them move away from it. Um, after a while, we can maybe make it more strict and change the SC Linux rules to actually deny access. So that was one of the suggestions we got. And then finally, uh, at some point in the future, when nobody is using it, uh, all the apps are using the new interface, then we can possibly uh, just uh, remove the driver. The backup plan is in case there are apps that are just not getting updated and the worst case scenario is we were thinking of uh, writing a very small uh, driver that does not have the pinning unpinning support, which we have deprecated anyway, but it but still makes the API work and move that out of staging and into drivers Android. So probably Greg would have something to say if he's <laughs> Oh, there it is. Um, not breaking user space API is important. I understand that. But if you're implementing something that you know is broken, why, why add it back, right? Because you know, I mean, it isn't just pin and unsp unpin that's the issue, right? Uh, no, it's it's not just that. It's the it's the fact that you know this is exposed to applications that don't go through libraries but directly open dev ashmem and make iocdls on that and they, they've written their own code to do that and if they don't update themselves then they break right but haven't you protected raw access to dev in android for a long time i mean user space applications <laughs> shouldn't be able to do that they shouldn't have the permission really user space apps could do that But Binder, I thought, was at least went through LibBinder. Yes, it does. Library doesn't have context in SE. Ah. Uh, so I, that was the reason I pushed it to go, like, how are you going to make sure all access to the platform are going to Libc? I think that it's going to have to be the other way around, where we replace Libc or to start using MFT. Yes. And then you start having that because, because then you're guaranteed that all the accesses to Ashmim are not coming via library but are open coded. But yeah, Ashmim has always been open. So yeah, we will end up breaking user space if we do anything.
Yeah, go ahead. So, slightly different topic, but are you planning, like, you're going to add SE Linux rules to flag, like, those device, those apps that actually open DevAsh Mem directly? Are you planning on surfacing that through the Play Store, or how are you planning on actually auditing that? So this, the point of SE Linux is very new, actually, uh, so I'm still working with the security folks to figure out what the audit results are going to look like. I don't think we publish it anywhere, as far as I know. Because so, are you planning on running every app in the Play Store and s flagging, <laughs> looking at the kernel logs? Yeah, I'll have to get back to you on, on that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the, the, there are ways to well, like, uh, uh, there are ways we can do in order to figure that out. But the problem is, how do we make sure that? is deprecated because I don't think that's going to happen sooner than we get memfd ready for replacement in libcutils. And so, yes. So the problem is how do we, what's the, what's our stopgap solution? So would, should we have like a wrapper driver that he was saying for the, while we try to work on apps removing the open code thing? Because that's the long tail basically. Well, I mean, if you, I mean, I see no difference between this one and the small driver than what we have in driver staging today. I mean, I said I'll leave it alone until you guys figure out how to do this. I'm not going to delete it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, we, we, this was not about deleting it, like, right now or something. But no, but I mean, so rip out pin and unpin support today from what we have. Once you get the MFT stuff and the library yeah. working, and go from there. I mean, if we can start yeah, deleting the, stuff. The, yeah, that's what I, I mentioned that, like, I think I mentioned it somewhere that we could yeah. take out a take out a huge chunk of the driver that nobody's using, keep the interface. Is it and then is it possible to keep the user space interface for Ashbem, but internally use MemFD all the way? Uh, uh, five minutes. I, I don't. I wish. I don't think the API lends itself to that. Don't well, we're going to map user space API to use MemFD anyway. But you have more, we're not you have more control over the file API. descriptor, right? In user space. We need file descriptor, yes. I think you have more. I don't know. But if you could, rewrite it to do the same thing. So internally use MemFD in the driver while you're keeping the use, use space the same. I don't yeah, know if it's possible. That's uh, going to be very messy, but <coughs> we, we, we do, uh, ideally don't want to do that. It's kind of, it's kind of like babysitting user space and con allowing them to continue to. Well, no. I, know, this, again, this is a stopgap solution. But, but it gets rid of the whole. The hope is it removes the Ashmem code as it stands, and it's basically a wrapper to memfd create, like for example, uh, ion buffers are to DMA buff. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Having Ashmem in upstream. Well, it's, it's been there. Uh, I, I, I don't like that. I mean, ideally, I'd like it to be deleted, right? Because it's duplicating functionality we have elsewhere. If you can rewrite it around memfd, there's also some fun things. We can run user space code from modules in kernel space that we might be able to wrap fun way. I'll talk to you later about that. Um, if you want to just wrap it that way, we might be able to keep the same kernel interface. If I mean, That's the problem is you have to keep this kernel API. Yes. We made that guarantee. So let's work and figure it out. But yeah. doing the work that you have so far is great, so future stuff doesn't touch it. Yeah. If we can evolve over time. And I'm not going to delete it. So. <laughs> I know people use it. I'd love to delete Ion. So I know Parcel, like what we use in Binder to transfer stuff, uses Ashmem. When you go beyond like the typical binary transaction windows, if you pass like a blob of a binder that's bigger than a megabyte, it transparently uses ashmem. So I wonder if this is a problem with Treble, where you know we going to update like the system partition to migrate to memfd, and you send something to vendor code, and the vendor code still uses the old libc utils and expects it to be an ashmem file descriptor. So is that something you you thought about, or? No, I haven't thought about that. Okay, let's talk offline. But uh, yeah, that's yeah. something I wondered about. Because there is this implicit assumption in. Does in a vendor partition have its own copy of serials? Yeah, well, yeah, it can. Should. <laughs> you no, know, it does because of trouble. Yeah, so this is for new devices only, right? Well, but if you do it for new devices only, then you're golden. Yeah. 
Right, but then that means you, we're still going to send the new version of system which uses new LabC utils to all devices too, right? But there is no old vendor. Everything is brand new, so everything's talking to MemoryMT. Okay, but that means we need to have a version of system for old vendor and new vendor, right? Yes, which is what the VMDK would give you. Okay, let's talk offline. One minute. There. I'm just a little sad that nobody really likes unpinning. <laughs> That's no, it. Nobody likes what? Sorry. Nobody seems to like unpinning, but I thought it was so elegant, so it's <laughs> just my, 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 whoa. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Joel. Thank you. you're up again. All yours. Uh, sorry, guys. Yeah. Okay, uh, I actually don't have anything yeah, yeah. to tell in this lunch. Uh, <laughs> I talked all about it in uh, yesterday's talk, but I'm going to go through it very quickly just to just in case someone wasn't there. Uh, that uh, out of three <laughs> hardware supporting code, uh, pretty much every single Android device has millions and millions of lines of those. Uh, how can we do or deal with it and why carrying kernel updates with Android because Android has the problem where we're pretty much carrying about five to six kernels. I think to give you a perspective, I think we still have 310 kernel, uh, uh, which, is, which was released in 2013. Um, so with Project Treble, well, what we, we ended up doing GSI, which is what we call generic system image, and uh, we use that system image that is built almost out of AOSP code, and, uh, but uh, the project travel implementation is verified by basically booting that system image on any Android device. Uh, that pretty much verifies all the interfaces between platform and the vendor implementation are implemented correctly. Uh, we also run a couple of test suites on top of a device that's booted with GSI, so uh, that basically proves the entire idea of Project Treble where we have uh, stable interfaces across platform and vendor and then, so that means we can move platform forward as long as we are not big breaking those interfaces without having to update anything from the hardware specific parts. Uh, the GTI basically is analogous to GSI in that case. We wanted to explore the option where can we do that with the kernel because we really don't want or like of maintaining 310 kernel in 2018, for example, uh, which is five years old. We are maintaining six of them at the same time. And uh, so we started on this study about, is it possible or can we start small? Can we maybe start with a single architecture, say ARM64, which we know uh, was written pretty much to be, uh, for the, at least the CPU code was written pretty much to be uh, as runtime configurable or as an, um, Pretty much everything is detected in the boot, at the boot time, but we are not sure whether everything is. We I went through, we went through a bunch of small subsystems. All of them are configurable through uh, device tree, uh, but there are big subsystems that I know. Alistair is going to talk about DRM as the display, camera, graphics. Are there any uh, uh, core? Are there any SOCs that need something core in the upstream kernel right now that's just completely missing, which will basically stop them from booting? I know there are a whole bunch of non-architecture uh, or non-SOC or non-hardware specific changes that every single kernel has, and we welcome that. That's, that's absolutely fine. But what we are trying to find out, or what I'm trying to gauge, and this is basically what is up for question, is is it feasible as of today? What do we see as uh, possible blocking uh, issues? I listed the two of the display cameras, two some two of them that I worry about. What, what else are we missing? Is there, for example, ARM64 CPU code, is it all there? Does it cover all the ARM um, uh, variants? Does clock framework cover everything? I actually don't know, so I intend to ask you. Uh, does, uh, do we have all the support needed for power management, for PMIX, for uh, regulators? Is that, can that all be configured and 
um, through device trees, so the kernel basically just boots. Uh, obviously, this assumes that anything that is uh, needed to the generic kernel is loadable as kernel module, which means you need file systems, and in, in which case the initRD basically ends up playing that role as well, where you don't actually need the storage. You can basically have those kernel modules in the initRD as long as you can boot to init. So what we are looking for is basically boot to init. Can we boot to init on any ARM64 CPU today? And if we can boot to init, then anything else that you need from then onwards to boot Android can be loaded as kernel module as long as you have support for device to specify those things. Uh, and that's pretty much the question. Uh, we've been looking at it and uh, uh, we've gone through a couple of subsystems, but we still don't know anything. So that's pretty much the question that I have here for everyone and basically this one. If you see this as a problem or you see, or you think upstream kernel is already ready for this and we should basically go ahead and find the hardware to do this. So in order to have a generic kernel, don't you need like a guaranteed ABI between modules and the kernel itself? And what do maintainers think about that? <laughs> so this is a generic kernel interface. So think of this as an enterprise kernel, like a Red Hat enterprise kernel, right? They say, we're going this way. And then they also make a guarantee. These certain APIs aren't going to change. So you don't have to rebuild modules. But let's just try and see, can we boot everything as a module today? Then let's take the next step of, um, then we'll worry about APIs. Um, right. the, the answer is, um, a, a, well, an all mod config con kernel almost boots on a lot of platforms. Um, and that's mostly stupid options that get turned on by default when you run all mod config we don't actually want to turn on uh, rather than uh, drivers. So, um, the answer should be yes. Is there, is there any assumptions we make from things like firmware or bootloader to set up clocks, for example? Or can may, may, maybe maybe clock? some platforms do, but the, the kernel shouldn't. Uh, uh, on what about security engines? For example, do you need to talk to a security engine in an SOC-specific way before you start running the stuff from the RAM disk? Uh, the, all of the verification, assume, I'm assuming you're, talk, you're talking about verification. For verification mm -hmm. parts, when you're booting the kernel for Android in the verified boot chain, you're all, you've already verified what you're booting. Not necessarily verified boot, but things like um, any kind of IPC channel establishment with trust with the trust zone, something yeah. that's running in the trust zone or the secure element. I don't know. There, a lot of them are also, again, SOC specific. I right. don't know. And those, could those be modules? And would it be valid to load them at the NIP yeah. first time? Uh, actually, to be honest, I'm not actually worried about having drivers as modules. I know that's going to be feasible. What I'm worried about is subsystems not having, say, enough exported symbol in order for those drivers to function that way, or device bindings that don't exist, or we don't we need more code in order to configure those devices that way. You want to say something more? I'm I'm just surprised you think this would be a problem. Perfect. Well, the goal was to have this the goal of ARM64 was to make this work. Yeah. I yes. don't think anybody's tested this. Which is, which is why I <laughs> no, we, the ARM64 in this. I know. We, I'm not asking about ARM, of course. Uh, we, we, no, uh, people, I mean, the reason I know about all mod config is uh, so there's somebody at Lenaro who's been testing that okay. for test purposes, uh, unrelated to Perfect. like deploying in production. Right. Um, so, if we, if, so I guess the, the big question is if it works today, then we can tell the SOC vendors your 2.5 million lines of code better not break that assumption. Yes. Well, that's, 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 that's the part of the compliance. That's the part of the compliance. And that's, that's the big key. And that yeah. would be the good. That would help them clean up their code. And if it doesn't work today, it's probably more in the small bugs somebody can fix level than anything massive. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the building stuff as modules is covered by all the build coverage stuff. Yes. That's like export symbols and stuff are fine. And the device tree stuff is unaffected by whether you're building modular, so. Well, yeah, there, there, like for example, there may be some architecture. Say, uh, here's here's a case which uh, I thought of, totally hypothetical. I don't even know if there is such a thing. There is, there are coprocessors that are booting with ARM at the same time, and you basically, because of you dealing it everything up until any runs. Now you're dealing in the whole boot sequence, and those coprocessors are also actually responsible for turning on clocks, for example. 
and then that all works because everything is baked into the kernel, so kernel initializes all of that right at the boot time before anything happens, and now all of that is not going to happen. If there are such assumptions made for some platforms, not in upstream, but for some platforms, and then they may or may not work, and I don't know if they exist. Yeah, what I can see is some things um, where you have implicit dependencies between drivers like that that aren't described, that just happens by luck to work in a monolithic kernel. Right. I would consider that a bug no matter what. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. yeah. Uh, to, to what extent can we assume that the bootloader will take care of this baseline configuration before handing over to the kernel? I don't think, well, that's what Mark was saying. I don't think the kernel assumes anything apart from the, where the device tree is and a bunch yeah. of parameters in front of it. I mean, if, if you're booting from an NRD, then uh, it doesn't really matter. The, the boot, what the bootloader is doing is the same no matter wh whether it was booting modular or um, built in. I mean, it's still the bootloader is handing the, uh, it's starting the kernel and saying here is a block of memory with the init RAM disk in it. I mean, so long as the RAM works, you're probably fine, hopefully. <laughs> So in terms of who's actually testing stuff like this, kernel CI today actually is testing the, the boot to RAM disk model with the kind of the upstream dev config yeah. for ARM64. The boot to RAM disk is like our baseline minimum. So on the on the 20 or 30 different ARM64 platforms that are already in kernel CI, this but, this just works. But, uh, but remember, dev config has a bunch of stuff built in. Yeah, yeah, but dev config has, it's, it's still kind of a smaller set yeah, of yeah. config. And we we have been trying all mod config, but you actually need all mod config plus a few other things turned back on in order to do basic boot. Well, and actually, uh, for this test, like I said, if, if if modules are assumed to work as is, and that doesn't, so yeah. it doesn't even have to be all mod. It's basically ARM64 with just initRD as root, and you get console, and that's it. That's yeah, yeah, that's need. that's basically the that's what kernel CI does yeah. today on all the okay. ARM64. Okay. Uh, does all mod config produce stable outputs? Like if you run it twice, is it guaranteed to? Yeah? Yes. Yes. But well, yes. The, 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 the bit, what uses space, uh, you, it uses space problem if the boots are terminalistic. I was just thinking, you mentioned that there are conflicting options that get toggled, okay, not the way stable. that we, that's stable, but all right. So does it make sense for uh, kconfig to be enhanced in order to call these out at the moment? So, and then you go back and you turn on your specific ones you need to build your platform and you make a def config for your platform. You can make a def config, here's a few things that are enabled. Even x86 is that way. I don't know if x86 can build an all mod config. I mean, the, the, uh, obvious, the obvious thing is like you, you do all mod config and even your drivers, drivers for serial console get t turned into modules so you can't actually boot and see any serial output. So you might be booting but you're not getting anything that's detectable by the test framework. So. Yeah. So yeah. there, there's just a few, there's, there is some actual minimal things that you want to build in in order to, yeah. to boot, even and, boot. And, and, and there's also some things that all mod, like um, select, selections from enums and uh, from choices and things that all mod config does that are just really stupid that you would never do in production. Yeah. Is it even? even is it just a build test? Can an all mod config cause certain pieces of code to not be built? Yeah. Yes. Right, yeah. so then, so even as a build test, it's not giving us... It's not giving, like, some other stuff, some other talk we have. It doesn't do a full, it won't build the whole thing. I don't right. guys. So there are, because it's, like, some are enumerated types of... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like we, we, only, we can only have one memory allocation algorithm at once, for example. Mm. Yeah. Three minutes. Yeah. Somewhere in the back corner, I'll say. Todd. Where? Yeah, I mean, uh, just in terms of subsystems there, you've got the like, display and graphic stuff. One subsystem that at the moment cannot possibly be modular is the IOMMU one, which a lot of the display and media peripherals might depend on. Now, oh. in theory, it's, it's okay to build a kernel today with all of the possible IOMU drivers built in for ARM64. You know, they won't fight with each other, but that does mean then you've got, you've got to build a kernel for all of the currently known devices and can't add them later. 
I, I, I always thought IMMU drivers were registered with one of those DMA bus subsystems, so the, the calls into drivers go, I haven't even looked at it by the way, so thanks for bringing it up. But the call, the, the implementation of IMMU was still a register and register interface into a core subsystem, and if that's not the case, then I guess we need to work on this. Yes, I mean, that's on this. Yeah, the drivers register themselves in, into the core subsystem. The problem is then the devices behind the IMMUs right. depend on the IMMU driver being detected first. Yeah. So you will end up not probing any of your graphics stuff until in it, and then you'll give up because there's no IMMU driver, and then if you do load those, they will have to work without the IMMU, which generally means they won't work very well. But then do we have a case where IMMUs would be, driver would be needed and needed for boot to RAM disk, for example? Uh, probably not on mobile. Well, in that case, then we can load the IMMU driver first, followed by the rest of the peripherals. If it's, if it's all built in, yes. Like I say, cu currently it's impossible to boil down anything as a module in IMMU. Okay. Well, yeah, well, well, that doesn't work for sure, because then we need to fix that. Yeah. The, there's some hilarity with how we figure out whether there's an IMMU in use as well, which I can't remember if anybody fixed, um, which required it to be built in. Well, yeah, well, I guess, there is, uh, they are not represented in device tree at all today, are they? Well, uh, yes, they are. Yeah, they are. they are. But then how does DMA buff, when the buffer is being transferred from one device to the other, would it automatically get mapped into that device's address space via IMMU driver, if I mention it in device tree? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm not that familiar with the way DMA buff works, but I believe it should it should automatically handle this when okay. necessary. Yeah, the, the, the other driver has to actually call the DMA map and map to actually. Right. To get a map it on the. But thanks, I'll come and talk to you right after for sure. One right. other question I had is like for the clock and power, do you see that as well as, you know, being part of modules? Oh, uh, yes, anything apart from what you need to run CPUs, for example. Because, you know, for CPU itself, you know, during boot up, you know, there's usually cases where they want to bump up the frequencies and stuff, and so there's some minimal clock power. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm mm -hmm. going to have to cut you off because we're really out of time, so I'll commit you guys to pick this up All afterwards. Cool. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, Alistair. So DRM KMS for Android, um, if I can find my mouse. <coughs> All yours. <coughs> uh, hi. Um, my name's Arthur Strack and I work for Google. Uh, I just wanted to talk to you guys about uh, DRM KMS for Android. Um, I. Uh, looked back at a few other presentations that have been done over the years about this subject. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of interest in DRM KMS for Android, but there hasn't been a whole lot of action in actually implementing it. Um, so one of the things uh, I was just going to go through was exactly why we want to use DRM KMS, why is the problem today that we don't use it, um, what's happened over the last few years with DRM KMS, and kind of where we want to get to. Um, so this is kind of a classic uh, thing that you'll see on most, um, on most uh, shipping Android implementations. You'll have uh, an uh, IP provider or the SOC manufacturer will, sh will provide the 3D core, the 3D graphics driver, the video driver, the display driver, the scaler, and everything will all be built in as some kind of mega driver. Or there might be separate drivers, but they won't be using standard kernel interfaces. And they'll have some kind of proprietary interface that runs between kernel and user space. And this is not a problem for Android because Android doesn't specify uh, that you have to use any particular kernel interface. And the HAL abstraction layer allows you to hide this behind the Gralic and the Harbor Composer module. Um, but this does cause problems for us because um, in, based on what Sandeep was just saying about GKI, uh, we don't really want to have so much uh, custom code running inside modules because if there's a security problem found or there's some other capability that we want to add, 
we should be able to do that in the kernel, in the core kernel, rather than having to do it in the driver modules, uh, which, we, which we would obviously prefer not to touch. And there are other reasons as well why, why DRM KMS is the right thing to, to do. Um, so, as I said, there's no requirement to standardize uh, in, in Android. Um, most shipping implementations are still using FBDEV. Um, we, code duplication is a problem. Uh, everybody implements their own display code, their own synchronization mechanisms, their own communication paths with GPU and, and VPU, and uh, there's not really any reason for that. Um, these drivers aren't on stream, and obviously it'd be great if they were, because a lot of, a lot of devices with AOSP, for example, you can build the kernel and the user space for them, but then you can't actually see the graphics without blobs or without additional drivers to the kernel. And you certainly can't boot non-SOC kernels on those devices because you will lack these multimedia drivers. So upstream is good. Um, and another thing that's important to us is the ability to actually test and debug display drivers, which currently we really can't do because of these proprietary interfaces that are being used for display. So back in 2013, uh, Collabora and uh, Lenaro and Google all worked together to merge the um, to destage the sync driver and merge uh, DRM KMS explicit fencing with support. And then on the Google side, we enabled um, the non speculative fencing capability in the Harbor Composer 2 API, which would have which opened the door to actually supporting DRM KMS. But then, unfortunately, because the changes went into uh, 410 and not 49, they weren't in the 49 LTS. So a lot of partners didn't have those changes. And we ended up backporting them in May. Um, Pixel 1 shipped with the original uh, frame buffer driver and the, multi, the um, Snapdragon uh, frame buffer driver. Uh, and then, unfortunately, again, in October 2017, Pixel 2 again shipped with FBDEV, even though we had the capability to, to do something with DRM KMS. Um, and, but finally now, in October 2018, we've shipped a DRM driver, DRM KMS driver on uh, Qualcomm uh, SOCs, which is great. Um, but what's interesting about this is that because we have a sliding three kernel support window for Android, when we get to Android with Q, we'll, we'll only have to support 4.9, 4.14, and 4.19, and all those kernels will have DRM KMS uh, capability because it'll all have the in-out fencing model that's required for uh, Harbor Composer 2. So hopefully we'll have DRM everywhere at some point. So this is the new model that we'd like to see. Uh, we'd like to see um, the core kernel DRM subsystem, the display driver, be upstream. And the 3D driver, we're not really trying to touch that at the moment. Uh, obviously, we'd have to support DRM render nodes to work with the display. Um, and then the video codec and the scaler are problems that, that will be solved at a later time. Uh, the libdrm, the Gralit module, and the DRM Harbor Composer module can then be provided from a generic source if the vendor doesn't need to differentiate these components. Um, and in fact, one thing that we are actually looking at as well is whether we could actually get rid of the DRM Harbor Composer altogether and just do everything, call everything from the framework itself. Um, so we'll end up with one display driver interface for Android, more shared code, better debugging, and uh, uh, a, better, a better mechanism for testing, a standardized mechanism for testing on SOCs. Um, one of the key things that we're thinking about adding is uh, bringing the Intel GPU tools test suite into Android VTS. Uh, so if we detect DRM KMS, we'll test it using Intel GPU tools. And then and maybe eventually we'll require shipping implementations to pass those tests. <coughs> so current status, just to give you guys an idea of where we are with, um, with our Pixel 3 device, a uh, very small number of changes to the DRM core that's required to support the modified uh, uh, MSM DRM driver, and then there is a large number of outstanding device-specific changes that were made to the MSM driver for the Snapdragon display engine. Um, those are, I believe, that uh, uh, Coderora are working to upstream those changes to the mainline kernel. Um, so hopefully they'll, they'll they'll go upstream at some point. At least some of them will. Um, and in the open source, we've tried to make sure that we're doing the right thing as well with anything that's involved in the DRM stack. So LibDRM, Mesa, and DRM Harbor Composer have now all been resynced with upstream. Um, we've enabled DRM KMS on HiKey and HiKey 916 OSP, and the new board that we're about to add, the BeagleBoard X15, already uses DRM KMS from the get-go. 
and Pixel 3 has already been released at AOSP as well, and it uses DRM KMS. And the Intel GPU tools will hopefully be added shortly to AOSP. And another couple of things that we're thinking about in the future will be, obviously, we'll have all our boards as DRM KMS. Um, we'll, all the implementations will be tested using Intel GPU tools. And we'll hopefully also be able to start setting up uh, Chameleon uh, display validation. And what this, what this little board does is um, it takes video in from the, from the, uh, the phone or the, the device under test and then it can actually send that information to, uh, to another machine. Um, and it can use that to compare gold and CRCs without necessarily requiring write back support on the display engine. So hopefully when we have that in place, we'll be able to say, somebody check something into the kernel, run the Harbor Composer tests on, on, on top of the, the DRM KMS driver, and if something visually is wrong, then we'll be able to say that was a bad change. Uh, and that, that, that's really where we want to get to from a display point of view. So that's all I had. Anybody's got any questions? Uh, I think we'd prefer that you call the Intel GPU tools project the IGT project. It's, we want to on-brand it as quickly as possible. Just IGT. It's called IGT now. I think it's called IGT test, graphics test suite. It's, it's recursive. But okay. we're trying to remove the Intel from it because some people are like, oh, we don't want to contribute to something with Intel in it. That's so. great. That is great to hear. Um, so what, what, just, I'm just curious, what's the contribution model for IGT? Uh, I'm not a maintainer, so there's two other people who maintain. <laughs> Uh, but essentially, like, send it to the mailing list, get it reviewed. Once you have, like, a handful of patches and want to keep contributing, we give you commit rights. Uh, there's a CI bot testing the stuff to make cool. sure th things keep working. So I think if we mirror the project and we encourage partners to upstream those patches, then we just mirror that project, and then they'll, they'll just suck up those tests, which would be great. Anything else? So we got five minutes to go. Can you say anything about the plans about codex? Uh, sorry, the video encoder and the. Um, I think it, it will go along a similar line. So uh, when we have the time to kind of deconstruct what the things that we can see are doing and what's missing in the upstream kernel, we'll <coughs> take a look and see what we can do upstream to address those issues and we'll will start to do a similar thing for video. Um, the reason why I've looked at display first is that I believe that we are in a place now where there's no reason not to use DRM KMS upstream. Um, there may be value add functionality from the SOC manufacturers that is not currently <coughs> implemented in the core kernel, but uh, if Pixel 3 was able to ship with it, it's a, good, it's a step in the right direction, which proves that you can really do it. So we would want to see a similar thing for the, the reason why I'm asking is because some of the stuff in the display, for example, modifiers, works. You can test it better if you have a producer that usually is not in the yes, display. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, <clears throat> yes, I mean, we will we will probably need to end up baking a lot of data that for, to test this effectively. If you're using something like a tile texture for a tile pixel format or FB compression or something like that, we'll need blobs that we can actually upload to test the display engine not necessarily have it produced by another high IP core if we don't have that available for testing. I'm wondering um, <clears throat> which uh, our uh, Composer implementation is being used in the Pixel 3? Pixel 3 does not use DRM Hub Composer. They have, Qualcomm have a, their own implementation, which okay. I believe is open source. Okay, and is there any reason for that? Any big gap in functionality? Or? Uh, that is an excellent question. I don't know. Okay. Uh, we would obviously, if, 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 we, our goal right now is not to require that DRM Harbor Composer is used, or that there is a standard Harbor Composer, but should the graphics team of Android decide that they don't want that abstraction anymore, then we would want to be in a place where we knew that everybody behaved correctly with the standard interface. So we, we don't want to see, like, Nothing works unless you call a magic eye octal or event a specific extension before you can actually composite on the screen. So that's where IGT comes in. If we can show that basic things work, then we might be able to go forward with getting rid of the Harbor Composer HAL. The Harbor Composer HAL is a really tough thing because uh, most Harbor Composers don't just do what the 
Harbour Composer spec says they should do. They're actually a nexus for information that comes through from the GPU driver, from the video decoder, from everything. And they, they, will, they will handle all those peripherals inside the DRM Harbour Composer. Uh, and that's something that we want to discourage. We're trying to break up those connections so that people don't do that from their Harbour Composers. Um, and that's kind of the, probably the toughest part of this problem. Um, but right now, it's not necessarily our focus. But you still need a place where you're going to put all the knowledge that you can't express it through the DRM IPA. Yes. So uh, there is an idea to add something called the planner. And the planner will be something like a DRM Harbor Composer, but it will not have the right to call into the kernel. So it will, or not to the display engine, engine directly. So it will be able to collate information potentially through the binder or through some other, maybe it will be able to access SysFS or some other limited set of functionality that will allow it to, to come up with a composition plan that it then sends to Surface Flink, which will actually submit the commands to the display. So the idea is that the the, the, the DRM Harbor Composer is no longer in sole control of how the screen gets programmed. And the advantage of that is that when we start writing tests, we don't have to write tests that are vendor specific that call, if, if def Intel, don't do this thing because there's a bug, or don't call the, call the, the DRM IOP tools in this particular way due to this hard level limitation. What we instead do is just send it to the planner, which is a, a vendor component, get back a composition which has filtered out anything that the Harbor can't manage or would prefer to do and then just push it through to the display via Surface Point. But that's not been implemented, and I don't think it's planned to be implemented for Q. So at the moment, it's status quo with Q. There's also the option to go via atomic check in the DRM, although... Yes, yes, <coughs> absolutely. Um, there, are some, yeah, there are some drawbacks to atomic checking, like I guess performance, uh, when you have to go back to the kernel, if you, especially if you do it multiple times. Um, but it's definitely a good way of going forward. I think that's something that we were planning on adding to DRM Harbor Composer, but it hasn't already been added. No. I think at the moment the rules are kind of hard coded, but uh, I think each SOC, each SOC customization on DRM Harbor Composer can provide a planning algorithm. I don't know if it necessarily does something like you're suggesting, but we could definitely add that. All right. Thanks, Alistair. All right. <coughs> so, <laughs> no Android MC would be complete without a discussion of Ion. Um, is that on? Oh, there we go. All right, so this is me talking about ION this year once again at uh, LPC. Uh, so I just did a really quick overview about what has changed up the S last year. Um, still, we have a net deletion of code, which I think is good progress and shows what's going on. Uh, there's been a lot of work to clean up the ION, ION framework, keep removing things that aren't needed, and really start to focus things. And if I, uh, if I hadn't already submitted the slide, I probably would have added a slide just now talking about, so are we deleting ION, and why do we still need ION? And uh, every year this comes up and people ask me, so do we still need it? And I think the short answer I've come to is that I think ION does still serve a purpose, but it's a slightly different purpose than maybe what it started out as. Uh, it's, not going to, it's not solving the problem about trying to be a constraint solver or everything. It's really <coughs> providing a simple, memory allocation space, allocation API for user space to be al able to allocate a certain set of memory and then pass those off to uh, DMA buff importers. So that's what I see ION as the use case for. I've, it's come up a couple different places. If for some reason we all got together and decided that maybe all those use, all the people who actually want to use ION could use something else, I would be more than happy to delete it, but people keep saying they want ION, so for now we're uh, still gonna keep it around. So the question is, is that ION still in staging? What's actually blocking ION going out of staging? These are the big issues, I think, that uh, are blocking um, ION staging. Uh, the first is ION uncached allocations. ION has support cache and uncached allocations since it was created. Uh, as we move to uh, properly use the DMA APIs and a better coherency model, it turns out that trying to make the uncached allocations actually work properly with that is very tricky. Uh, because we actually have to call the DMA APIs in the right order, what we find is, is that you can't, you can't actually do this in a, in a way, in a, 
you end up, end up with a catch-22 about trying to synchronize pages without actually having access to uh, part of the device structure. So it makes trying to get uncached allocations that are actually safe very difficult. Um, I'd like to honestly just drop support for uncached allocations just because it seems like they're not a very popular use case, but there's some people who have code out of trees who really want that, so I'm working with them to review their use case and why exactly they think they need it, so that's still something we're working through. Um, at the very, another option I thought about is maybe just putting in a kernel config option saying allow uncached allocations just to allow, just to, just to be able to have it off in the default case for most people who may not need uncached allocations and then those who actually want to can turn it on. Uh, another relating issue is skipping uh, cache maintenance. So when I did the major rework a couple of kernel versions ago, I, I thought that the, it, when I did that, we would end up needing some, to do some minor optimizations to maybe get some performance back, uh, just because the way things were, were working, we are now calling DMA map, DMA unmap more often, and therefore we're also thinking having to sync the caches more often. But it turns out that this may have actually uh, introduced some major performance regressions, which we only found out until uh, fairly recently. So we're looking at that to try and uh, do some optimizations, and the optimizations we're looking at should be fairly, um, seem like they, sh they should be fairly obvious things to do, mostly because when the initial code for this was written by me, I kind of took the, what I think of as the slow and obvious approach instead of maybe the slightly smarter approach, just to, just to get a proof of concept out there to show that the IN stuff was actually working correctly and then work about speeding it up. But clearly we need to do some more work about uh, thinking about that. I've been, again, discussing with some people with patches, some on list, some off list, about approaches to this. And I think the issue we've run into is tr trying to figure out how to actually meet all use cases that actually will make it possible to call the map and unmap in the right places. It sometimes kind of ties into places where the Android framework is, uh, seems to want to want to call this. I can talk about more of this during the discussion period. Uh, another sort of thorn in my side is the carve out chunk heaps. These are ones I still want to delete. I've perhaps was negligent to deleting them and you know, there's some, at least one person who wants to try and keep them around, but I need to review the patches just because nobody has really stepped up to, I think, do the hard part about figuring out how to actually tie the allocation in and get that s tied up in a generic way without having to call in to board specific platform code. And finally, the last one is uh, splitting up dev ion into dev heap zero, dev heap one. This has been something that's been requested just to have <laughs> finer grained security controls, uh, mostly the SE Linux layer for controlling individual dev nodes. So I've seen patches for that. I think we just need to work out exactly where the testing and review infrastructure goes. So discussion time, okay. Um, so uh, Lee and Pratik, I'm glad you're both here. Um, would you like to give a, f I, I'd like to see if we can just get some open questions. I think let's start with the uncached allocations if you want to give, you know, a 30 second summary of. Thirty seconds. Um, in the past, uh, most of our use cases, um, it's only the device that accesses the buffer, so we don't need to do any cache maintenance. Uh, in the past, in the rare cases where CPU did do access with the old version of Ion, we had ioctals, so the user space could call in and basically do the clean and invalidate. With the new version of Ion, we can't do that. Um, we can't rely on the user space being able to do the cache maintenance even through the DMA buff sync ioctals because there may not be a device attached. So we've had to switch over to using uh, cache maintenance always on DMA map uh, and DMA unmap just in case there might be uh, user space access, like you need the invalidate on the, inv on the unmap in case somebody in user space is going to access the memory. Um, and there may not be a device there for their begin CPU access to do cache maintenance. So that's why we switched to uncached for most of our use cases. That way we could safely skip the cache maintenance across the board. That was our main use case for uncached. Yeah, and I, I think part of my argument has always been this sort of seems like it's solving the wrong problem just because a, it sort of seems like it's a missing use case that if you're trying to call begin CPU access and you haven't actually called DMA buff attached, this means you're trying to call begin CPU access at the wrong time and therefore nothing should actually happen and it shouldn't actually be necessary and therefore we should actually be able to do that. So I guess I've never quite been able to grok exactly 
why user space still is trying to call, presumably hand off the buffer without actually um, having a device attached. And maybe this gets, gets to the point is, is that it sort of seems like somehow the Android framework, which seems to be doing this, once is, is not quite doing the buffer handoff the way I would expect with the DMA map, DMA on map APIs. So. Yeah, so I guess that's what it's coming down to is ideally, like we spoke a little bit before, is if you could have these devices in this use case just keep the buffer DMA mapped mm -hmm. uh, the whole time and then DMA unmap at the end of the use case, you'd be fine because then the user space begins CPU access and, and, and CPU access, there'd be a device there, it would work. But the clients like display and stuff have come back and said, we don't know when the use case ends because Android pipelines, so they don't, they can't, they can't wait to the end of the use case to call DMA unmap, so they, they always DMA map and DMA unmap while they're being, while this buffer comes to them in the pipeline. So they'd need to know, they need support from Android framework to know when the use case ends so that they could um, do the DMA unmap. Yeah, so this is sort of where we're stuck at right now about trying to work through this. Like I said, because we're still seeing requests for ION that are not necessarily Android specific, I'm trying not to throw too many uh, Android specific hacks into ION, but if we'll see what happens, so. There used to be the Graloc lock unlock very, very early in the days. Yeah. Uh, you're looking for something similar, if I'm not No, no, Graloc lock and unlock is, is, is fine and it's there, but the problem is, is it's, it's going to do the DMA sync, so the begin CPU access, and the Graloc unlock is going to do the DMA sync and um, end CPU access, which is all fine, but the problem is the device may not be attached anymore because it may have, <clears throat> so the, if the device isn't there in ION, then it won't do any cache maintenance. It'll just do a no op, and that's where you're in trouble. So, you know, you're, you're, you're attached. Uh, you get your device access, and then at some point, the buffer is being passed down the pipeline, so you have to DMA unmap and remove your device. And then there's some kind of post-processing by some module that does the, does the Graloc lock, but now it, can't, it doesn't result in any cache maintenance. Um, right. So you either always had to do your invalidate on the DMA unmap, which is wasteful on the case that there may be CPU access, which is not the normal case. So, so I, basically right now you're doing that every time you detach from the device the before you Yeah, you, they're always, yeah, the, the modules are always detaching. So, you know, if we could keep ourselves DMA map the whole time, we'd be fine, but they need to know, they need to be told at the end of the use case somehow to DMA unmap, and that's why they're not doing that. So it's a kind of... Yeah, so we're probably going to talk more about this afterwards if anyone yes. is interested, but... Um, I think those were the major issues we're still um, looking at. If anyone else has any comments about ION. Yeah, the, the one thing that I saw that was sort of weird is at least a, the DMA buff API. In the kernel on the DMA buff unmap, almost every existing driver does nothing. And so that sort of suggests if everybody's kind of taking this cheat, you know, to, to avoid doing the flushing, maybe the API isn't accurate, like, you know, yeah, it's uh, not what we really need. Yeah, I absolutely um, agreed, and this is something else I was going to think about looking at the DMA buff APIs as well, because I uh, agreed. When I implemented this, I was kind of going about what the APIs suggested just because try and follow the framework, but yeah. Four minutes to go. Okay. Anything else about ION? Otherwise, I'm happy to give people five minutes back. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we got one last presentation regarding cuttlefish. <coughs> there you go, sir. Floor is yours. Yeah, so um, Sandy mentioned this in his uh, kind of uh, his presentation yesterday, and a lot of people have asked me about it, so I just wanted to briefly explain what Cuttlefish is and why you might want to use it, why it's kind of interesting for kernel hacking. Um, so what is Cuttlefish? So Cuttlefish is an Android virtual device based on QME. Um, it's x86-64 based, uh, so we can use KVM, hardware, so hardware virtualization on the Google Cloud platform. Um, and on Google Cloud, if you want to use it on Google Cloud, because um, Google Cloud, uh, you, you would create a Linux file system on the Google Cloud, and then you would run this inside that 
that Linux file system. And it would use nested virtualization to achieve hardware acceleration. Um, it's it's vertio based um, for the most part. So the block, network, serial, GPU are all coming through the standard vertio uh, driver interfaces. Um, but there is this driver that we added to staging recently. I think it was added in 4.17, um, which uh, is still being used by some legacy components in the Cuttlefish port for things like uh, input and uh, audio. But we're planning on removing that. Um, <coughs> there's a kernel def config to enable those drivers and the Android features, which is in the Android kernel commentary. Um, and it's not to be confused with the Android emulator, which has a whole bunch of kernel changes like Goldfish pipe and Goldfish address space, which we don't need for Cuttlefish. Um, so that means that we can develop it upstream in the open. It's a develop, the user space is developed in AOSP, and the kernel changes are all developed uh, upstream in mainline Linux. Um, the Wi-Fi driver, which is used for virtual Wi-Fi on Cuttlefish, is not currently upstream. It's pending review on NetNext, but it should hopefully go in soon. Um, so if you want to build Cuttlefish, if you want to try it out, uh, these are the kind of steps you need to take. You just check out the code, launch it, um, build it as a usual platform, just like you would build for Pixel. Um, and then when you want to build yourself a kernel, you can just pull the kernel common, the common kernel, which normally can't be built for any specific target, but now it can. It can be built for Cuttlefish. Um, we have support in all of the kernel branches back to 3.18, um, but we obviously would recommend that you either 4.14 um, or the Android mainline tracking branch should be used. Mainline tracking is probably most useful for kernel developers because it, uh, you can try RCs, kernel RCs, which we've re we rebased the Android patch set on top of. Um, so it's just a kind of very simple flow to build the kernel. Nothing fancy there. Um, there's a custom tool that comes as part of the host build for Android when you build for Cuttlefish. You get this tool called Launch CVD, which is basically a wrapper around the QMU binary. And you can pass it a, a BZ image in kernel path, and it will pick that up and use that instead of the pre-built kernel that's checked in, um, which again is useful for kernel development. Um, it, this tool will actually pass to QMU all of the device parameters, the VertIO specification stuff, all the block devices, everything. So you don't need to worry about any of that. It just picks those things out of your Android build tree, out of, out of your product out directory. Um, you can use ADB just as you would on a real device. <coughs> You can connect to the display of the device using uh, type VNC, and you can get the kernel log uh, out of magic file and cuttlefish runtime. You can also retrieve a log cat if you don't want to use ADB. So when you fire up the VNC connection, this is what you'll get. You'll just get a standard AOSP build uh, in a phone configuration, um, and it'll be running inside VNC. So kind of, if you've ever used the Android emulator or the Android SDK, it's very similar to how that works. Uh, it's just it's using an unpatched version of QMU and uh, it can run mainline Linux kernels and AOSP, generic AOSP. Um, so stuff we need to do, um, this is all very new, so we obviously need to add documentation, probably mostly what I've just shown you and a little bit more to explain what it does. Um, eliminate the VSOC driver. Um, we're also working on adding uh, GPU acceleration to Cuttlefish, which is another way that we're gonna try and enable DRM KMS. So we're going to add uh, Verti GPU 3D support to the build so that uh, the graphics acceleration will be done on the host side, on the virtual machine, on the QMU side rather than actually in the guest. At the moment, Cuttlefish is using uh, Swift Shader, which is a software GPU implementation that runs it in the guest. Um, and we're, I've also just managed to get working the ARM64 build of Cuttlefish, which is uh, just using, it's basically a variant of the ARM64 def config that enables the Android options required to uh, run Android on top of uh, ARM64 def config, um, plus some another, a couple of other tweaks that we need for QMU. Um, so please try it out. It's a great way of developing for Android, Android kernels. Um, you can just boot Linux up, something breaks, you just control C it, start it up again. Or you can connect GDB to it, and you can set a breakpoint in the kernel using QMU's GDB facility. Um, if you've ever used QMU to debug a kernel, it's all those same features exist. It's just that this kind of handholds you through the Android integration, so you don't need to worry about building a specific build of Android or specifying specific flags to QMU. So I think that's everything I had to cover. Any questions? <laughs> um, so you mentioned uh, you're using Swift Shader at the moment. Uh, for the ARM64 port, does Swift Shader work in there now? Uh, so 
on a, if you build for ARM 64, you need to build an ARM uh, 32 user space, Bec just because of that reason. The Swift shaders code generation in the build system currently does not have ARM 64 support. Okay. But when we replace the, 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 the GP pipeline with Vertai GP 3D, that problem will go away. So I think um, it shouldn't take us too long to get that to land those changes. And the GPU support will also work in Google Cloud? For the Vertio? The, the intention is that if you, if you pay for the, the GPU instance, you'll okay. be able to use it on Google Cloud. That's, that's, that will be our primary test platform. But what we'll also enable is we'll actually use Swift Shader in QMU instead. So if you, don't want to enable, if you don't want hardware acceleration, but you still want to run on ARM64, that becomes a possibility because we'll be using an x86-64 Swift Shader, yeah. but an ARM64 binary user space, if that makes sense. OK, thanks. Just, it'll run really slow. So, you know. <laughs> so I, I assume I can install any applications that I, Android applications that I develop on Cuttlefish that's and right, test them as is. That's so right. So if that is the case, uh, why would I use this over uh, emulator? Sorry, I did not follow that part. So if you use, if you're, if you're developing the kernel for the emulator, you basically have to pick a version of the kernel that the emulator team have ported all of their changes to because oh. the emulator changes are not on stream. <laughs> Right. 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 So that the current release for the emulator, I think, is 4.4. .4. So if you want to work that far back, you can. Uh, the other thing is the, the emulator's QMU is a is a fork of QMU. So for the emulator to even work at all, you can't use a standard right. QMU build. You have to use the QMU that's checked into the <coughs> emulator, and that is not nice to use. So the uh, emulator that's distributed as part of the SDK has some. A lot, some quality of life stuff that you won't have on Cuttlefish. Like the UI is a lot nicer. Um, it already has pass through GPU support. Um, so, frankly, Cuttlefish is what I wish that our SDK emulator had evolved into. Yes. Um, and that sort of didn't happen for reasons out of my control and because of people who aren't here to defend themselves. So, I won't throw them under the bus. Um, <laughs> We've talked with the emulator team a little bit, and we're trying to push them towards using Vert.io for stuff like this. And so maybe it will converge to some point in the future, maybe it won't. But I would say if, if you are just a regular app developer, you probably don't care if you're running a, a tip a tree kernel, yeah. and so the SDK emulator is fine. If you're a kernel developer, you don't care as much about the quality of life stuff. You just want to be able to boot and attach VNC, yeah. and so Cuttlefish is great for that. Um, so you mentioned uh, that you're looking at converting a bunch of drivers uh, to Vert.io, including the audio stuff. Yeah. Have you concretely looked at the audio Vert.io stuff, or is that just a to-do at the minute? For us, we'll try and use any, if there's a pending Vert.io standard that we haven't, that we can use, we'll start looking at it. Um, the, but there, in the case of the GPU, for example, we might end up creating a fork of that because the way that Vertio, the, the user space that's being used with alongside Vertio GPU 3D is is, is n not necessarily something we want to use. Yeah, I, I, there there is some work going on in Vertio for audio, but I, I which I've not been able to find yeah. the actual specs for. Yeah. Uh, but I have some concerns about the description and how useful it is. So um, having a more useful thing, especially for use cases like this, yeah. would be um, super helpful. Yeah. Um, is it likely to be Eric that's looking at this, or if it's Vertio? Uh, I don't audio? know. I don't know. At the moment, we I don't we don't really we, we plan to to pursue that, but we haven't. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's an in planning rather than a concrete thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we will switch to Vertio input soon. There was no reason for us not to use it. We just didn't use it. So that that's an easy one to to use. Did you just say that something about Vertio GPU having some requiring changes or forking or, or did I miss here? So um, Vertio GPU is, so, and correct me if I'm wrong, Vertio GPU is a very basic Vertio driver. It's just exposing a DMA command buffer to the, to the user space. And we had some concerns that because Vertio GPU 3D is typically being used with Virgil, which is taking OpenGL OES streams and then converting to Gallium and then writing them into this command buffer and then communicating them back to 
the virtual support inside QME, virtual render support, that we wouldn't want to conflate that when we added our GPU tunneling support. Because we want to support Vulkan ultimately, and we want to support uh, debugging of GL <coughs> programs like they can with an emulator. And so we don't want a transliterated GL shader or a transliterated GL control stream. We don't need to run desktop GL inside Android. So what we're, lo we're looking at writing just a very simple binary, re binary representation of the OpenGL commands into that command buffer instead. So I don't know whether we'd actually need to tweak the Vertio spec to add in it like a, we are doing this crazy thing in the bi our binary format um, or not. I, I know I wrote it, but it's been a while. I'm pretty sure I, the, spe the uh, 3D, there's like you can pick a sort of a new protocol. So you can add acceleration protocols to the kernel. So currently, there's only, it only exposes one acceleration right. protocol. The, capa the capability set system right. exposes one acceleration protocol, so which is 3D. You can expose another. I, I had plans to expose Spice and a few other things, but like my Right, so we could do something like add a, an ID or whatever in the kernel yeah. that would then say, OK, if QMU's passed this thing through instead, then bind Yeah, the, the kernel will ask the QMU for a list of what it supports. Yeah. And you can, if you then support your own one, you can expose it to users. I mean, Vertio 3D, Vertio GP 3D is absolutely fine for what we were using. It's just literally that change. And we just wanted to make sure that we didn't make it cause any confusion about writing a binary stream is not compatible with what virtual render. Yeah, I, I, I'm very happy to take up stream if, if we can work that out. But I'm nearly sure, yeah, just adding another acceleration profile should, you know, then you can do what you want on your pipes. Awesome. So Thank we, you. We've got three minutes left. Have you thought of using uh, CrossVM instead of Kimu? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the reasons one of the reasons why we want to make sure that we are Vertio clean is that we are not tied to QMU. So one of the one of the things you'll see when you actually try Cuttlefish is it's doing this thing where it's using it's spawning an IVSH mem uh, in program that attaches to QMU to provide shared memory between the guests and the host, and we kind of want to get rid of that because it's very specific to QMU. So what we want to do is make sure everything uses Vertio instead, and then we should be more hypervisor agnostic. But for our own internal reasons, we may want to use cross VM at some point. And you can probably figure out that might lead to other things happening uh, as a result of using cross VM. But it will be QMU in AOSP for the time being. All right. Just wanted to make a comment on the difference between Cuttlefish and the emulator. They serve different audiences. The emulator has to run on Windows, has to run on Mac OS. Cuttlefish only ever cares about running on Linux. And so that allows us to uh, move faster and to have a cleaner code base. So the reason why the emulator has to run on Mac OS and on Windows is why QEMU is, QEMU is patched in the first place. So it's just a long, two different, two different audiences uh, is what I wanted to say. Yeah, another, thing, another cool thing you can do with Cuttlefish kernels as well is you can run them just on the command line with QMU. So there's nothing specifically even changed in the QMU DEF config or the patches that would disallow you from using just a normal QMU flow. So if you just wanted to boot like a Linux file system and just test some user space code or run like perf or some other binary that's hard to get on Android, you can just fire up the, 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 the Android binary kernel and test exactly the same thing using a Linux user space, which with Goldfish is a bit of a pain because it's expecting things like the NAND driver and the pipe driver and everything to be on the QMU side, which Cuttlefish does not require. OK, thank you. OK, so this is. That was pretty much the last uh, talk here. There's one, just one last housekeeping thing I wanted to do before uh, people kind of run out of the room, especially for people that were actually doing a presentation here. Give me one second if I can grab this and get it to the other side, which I kind of almost am able to do if I can find my mouse. Um, all right. Bingo. So I had some questions regarding filling this out for the speakers. Um, I'm just going to take the example of the uh, binder, uh, the um, dynamically allocated binders. So the wins, there was one of the designs that seemed to kind of surface being like the primary thing chosen. So I put that in there. There was a few of them that were kind of discarded. I put them in the losses. So the idea there is just to kind of give a really quick snapshot of in your talk what you thought was the winning track or not. 
um, so that people that are from the outside can get a bird's eye view of, of what happened uh, in your presentation. It doesn't have to be paragraphs, just like bullet items at most, all right? Um, other than that, thank you very much for attending, for participating, um, and you know, best of luck with your uh, upcoming Android projects, and see you next year.